Wishing our Jewish listeners a happy new year. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. The choice is going to mandate you get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. I love that about you, right, Gina Grad? That's right, Lashana Tova. And Bald Brian. Yeah, I kill motherfuckers and this and that. <laughs> I was uh, woke up uh, a little bit early this morning, turned on the TV, it was on the local news. And um, it's really part of why I can't do anything. <laughs> is because uh, if I see something, there's almost nothing I that is presented to me where I don't stop and go, what the fuck is, what's this? And then I got to stop, and then I have to figure it out. It was just on the news, uh, local news, and they were telling a story about a local man who punched a flight attendant in the back of the head. A rabbit punch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Bolo. <laughs> rabbit and bolo. Right in the back of the head. I, I filmed it off my TV set. So uh, the quality may vary a little bit. But I just looked at the store and I thought, all right, crazy guy punching someone on an airplane. What else is new? Mm. Uh, But then something struck me. And uh, we'll watch him uh, strike the flight attendant in the back of the head. The man from Orange County was caught on video punching a flight attendant on a plane to LAX. (laughs) Big sock in the back of the head. The attack happened last Wednesday on a flight from Cabo San Lucas to Los Angeles. Alexander Tung Lee from Westminster is facing a federal charge of interfering with members of a flight crew. If convicted, he faces a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. That footage didn't match the story, right? Because he punched some dude in sleeveless cutoffs. Mm-hmm. Hmm? Did he not just punch some guy in sleeve? Did I miss that? Was he wearing no, a vest? I, I think that was a sweater vest. Oh, I thought it was like sleeveless cutoffs and they fucked up the clip. But they didn't even say... They didn't even say, like, assault battery. They just said interfering with a flight attendant. I, I was not going any of these directions. The direction uh, I was going, it's a guy in a kind of Hawaiian shirt punching a guy in the back of the head. Um, then they cut to him in court with the with the court. Wait a second! Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that, it, when he's in court. Yeah. Oh, he has his lucky Hawaiian shirt on yes, still. Hey, it worked for me once. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I'm not Mark Aragos. Oh, good But I've talked to Mark many times about putting a guy in a nice V-neck Make pastel look sweater. Yeah. Uh, easily obtainable this year. Yeah. Uh, Old Navy, probably down the Costco street from the court, courthouse. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he shows up in what I'm assuming is the same Hawaiian shirt that he assaulted the flight attendant in. And, and they're going to look at the footage of this guy beating the guy. Now, maybe there's a method to his madness. Like, eh, look at the guy. He's wearing a Hawaiian yeah, shirt. Like, how, colors. how bad could he be? But Wow. We- and it, it's we're so, like, not paying attention, the rest of us, that I'm like, yeah, that's him. That's him in the shirt. But no, that's his court drawing. That's when he's a- on the stand, he's in the shirt. I am so fascinated. <laughs> I, I, I feel the same way about, you know, the guys who show up to the funeral in a maroon members only jacket right. or something like is there nothing in your closet is yeah. there not you do not possess one black button up shirt no. like a, do you or a sweater you just it doesn't solid color i get uh, it it's unseasonably patterns, yeah. hot but they do have air conditioning in the courthouse and you got your hawaiian shirt on now i was just sitting there staring at it and i was like you know the, the color palette is pretty close, but on the other hand, what are the duties of the courtroom sketch artist? Does he have to right. color in the entire shirt? Or yeah, if it's real busy, how, how yeah. much you want him work on? Is, is he calmly? Is it the exact same shirt he was wearing when he assaulted the flight attendant, or does he have a closet full of these? Is he like Steve Jobs? It's just a closet yeah. full of the same shirt. I don't shirt. want to spend too much time thinking of what to wear. Right? Wearing. Yeah, whether it's a Southwest flight and I'm assaulting someone, or I'm going to court for assaulting someone, I don't want to spend hours working on my ensemble good eye but i was like this motherfucker wore the same hawaiian shirt and 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 by the way i i'm I'm guessing when we get in front of the court we're going to look at the footage of you and your hawaiian shirt that's him it's going to be hard to go that wasn't me really you have the same tailor (laughs) that's amazing (laughs) who's bruno molly's are these this Uh, is a good time to remind people of your idea sweaters from earners for mm -hmm, the funerals mm mm-hmm yes if please, I probably have 30, I probably have 15 items in my closet that would be semi-appropriate to wear to a funeral <laughs> other than 
the Hawaiian punch guy. Right. Which now, by the way, you're going to be called oh, the Hawaiian well, punch good. guy. That's good. Because of your love of Hawaiian shirts. But and punching. I'm also curious about who's representing them. You know what I mean? Like I would have, I'd have. Someone I'd, court appointed. I'd have everything from, yeah, you know that, uh. That tattoo on your forearm that says LAPD need to take a hike to hell. I wear a long sleeve. Yeah. Uh, because I think our judge may have a son who may be enlist. You know, yeah. he may be wearing the blue. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, if I'm representing you, I shall go into my own. What are you, medium? Yeah, I'll grab you something from the closet. Yeah, I'll, I'll grab this you something. This is $90 well spent. Yes, I will uh, just pull something out and uh, you can just go ahead and pop it on yeah. in the parking structure. And uh, maybe not, not not your style, but maybe the judge has a different aesthetic that he's looking for. <laughs> so, uh, wow. yeah, he wore the Hawaiian shirt. Damn. Now, the Hawaiian shirt on the plane makes sense. Obviously, he was in vacation he's mode when he was punching the guy in the back of the head. But uh, now we're back to the sober daylight. Now we're in the courthouse and it's Monday. So we're going to need you to clean it up just a little bit. Ask Mark, is there a possibility this was like the, the morning after, like he was in the pokey and overnight and then it rained? I don't know. I, I don't, don't, know, I don't know. The, you should be in a the, jumpsuit. I don't know how the, yeah, I don't know how the court appointed guys work on that. But uh, you could still, uh, if you're representing this chap, you can still head over to the prison and get him some fresh clothes. Yeah. Like that's, uh, yeah, it's that's, possible. that's what Mark, Mark says he does it all the time. All right. <laughs> this wow. is why I cannot progress in my oh, life because God, all I wanted to do was done. turn the TV on and then switch a the channel, but I was transfixed by the Hawaiian punch. Mm. Um, another thing, I don't know if you guys had these jokes when you were family, familia mm. jokes where the where the um, your family had jokes that weren't really funny, but they liked them. Indeed. Mm. And for me, it, 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 was, it was in very sharp relief for me because I considered myself funny, but no one in my family considered me funny. So I would say funny things and they'd all just kind of look at me. And then once in a while, they'd trot out one of their yeah. isms and it would bust them up. Laugh, yeah. And then I was like, how come uh, no smiles when I'm yeah. laying down the world class comedy here at age 12? Um, I had this thought. I don't know how it got into my head. I don't think I've ever shared it, and I know I've shared every story a hundred times, but my grandparents would go out to dinner with, like, the Mandels, and they would go to some, poly no, not Polynesian Indonesian. place. Indonesian place. Uh, the guy's shirt got me going. Mm -hmm. And they would get a dish called Bami Goring. I now, I had never heard of it until, but I had, because Bami Goring sounds fucking fantastic it's the noodles and oh, beef or, take, or, or pork like a or whatever chow mein style. yeah kind of chow mein -y. and then my grandmother would come home and she would announce that uh, we're out to dinner with the mandels and um uh, uh, just for clarification uh, they were the gorogs laszlo and helen right. gorog she would then return and say that uh, she would go out with the Mandels and they would always order the Bami Gori. And uh, they liked it so much that uh, Trudy Mandel announced they should call it the Bami Gorog. And then she would laugh hysterically and, and then repeat it the next time, every time they went out and got the Bami Gori oh, right, in perpetuity. And I would just kind of go, not funny. <laughs> Not that interesting. Mildly amusing. <laughs> At I'm, best. I'm doing social observations right. here, and no one's ever told me to write a one of them down, but I got to hear the Bami Gorog story. You're like once fucking again. Nixon, man. Yeah, man. I'm doing like Mort Saul set <laughs> at that dinner table, and I'm hearing about the Bami Gorog. Ugh. But it did make me want Bami Gorog. Like, yeah. That looks delicious. Take it down. At the very least, I'd say you have higher self esteem because. When I was in those situations, my first thought would be, I don't think that's funny. There must be something wrong with me. My sense of humor must be wrong. But at least you knew. I was pretty objective. I was like, I think what I'm saying is funny. But I, I was influenced by their lack of laughter oh to, a, to a negative degree. It's that's not even a pun. What is it? Bami Gora. Yeah, it's not even a, not you even a pun. It's a play on words yeah. to an extent. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a joke for four people. Yes. Yes. I mean, because nobody... Yeah, it, no other restaurant. I can't like, work it okay. into my set because people don't know who the Gorogs are and they don't know what Bami Gori is. It'd so. take a lot of setup. 
That'd the, be a funny alt comic routine. Be like, do those jokes, but then spend the next five minutes. Now the background of that joke. That's is. right. Here's why you should have laughed. <laughs> then there is uh, this for you, Gina. Uh-huh. Popped in my head when I was talking on Take a Knee to Detective Paul Holes, mm-hmm. who uh, blew the lid off the Golden, Golden State, State Killer. Killer and many other cold cases as well. At the very end of the interview, with uh, three minutes left or so, it popped into my head. I was talking about all the official particulars, about all the gruesome details, about all the stories. And at a certain point, I thought, psychics, Mm. how does that play into any of this? Mm. Because sometimes when you argue with a kooky broad about the validity of psychics, Mm -hmm. they go, well, I think if detectives, units, police force would use them around the country uh, routinely, I I I think there's something there. Yeah, yeah. And I go, you know, it's it's like it is one of those arguments where you go, yeah, why would the Fresno PD use a psychic if there's just nothing right. there? Yeah. So I did. I posed the question to him. I said, how does this factor in? Does it work? Has it ever worked? What did he say? Well, we're about to hear right. it. Uh, last question, because it just popped into my head. I think about you hear about law enforcement u- using psychics for things. And then I always go, oh, get out of here. And then somebody will go, no, no, they did use a psychic in X, Y, or Z case. And then I kind of go, oh, get out. And then they go, yeah, but then why would they talk to a psychic uh, in your vast experience? Has that ever been a factor? It, is it is it? Is it, is it is it a wives' tale? Like, I mean, because they will go. They have spoken to psychics. So maybe they have, but is there any history or anything in your vast experience that's ever involved the psychic and solving a a murder? Well, psychics were um, used much more frequently back in the 70s when I was, you know, those are the, the era of the cases that I was focusing in on. So I have been involved in many, many cases in which psychics have weighed in. And in not one of those cases has the psychic provided any information that has led to solving the case, let alone, you know, just trying to find, you know, more physical evidence or anything like that. Um, You know, across the nation, could there have been occasion which the psychic threw a dart, you know, and and Mm -hmm. it just happened to land on the right detail? Possibly, Uh, you know, until I really see somebody who can consistently provide details using this psychic ability that are accurate. Uh, I am probably the ultimate skeptic when it comes to psychics. Uh, And, uh, you know, it's just, I don't see investigators today reaching out to psychics. What I see is psychics reaching out to law enforcement because they think they have something that they can provide to the investigators. But I've yet to be personally aware of a case in which whatever the psychic said actually led to solving the case. All right, so have that one chambered sane (laughs) man next time you're at a cocktail party with Susan Pinsky and she trots out the detective psychic. You know why that makes me, that, that disappoints me? Because I'm consistent. I want to believe i don't but i desperately want to so i want someone to sway me and he that's not swaying no i think he was pretty definitive yeah and so when people say you know i've worked with the you know lapd or whatever maybe that just means they reached out they they wanted to see if they could get in on a little something something i think it's like you uh take your clothes off and streak across the field during the Super Bowl. And then you go, I was a part of the Super Bowl 53. Right. I was on the field. I was on the New England side. Like, well, yeah, but you're being tackled. And the camera's like, cut away. You didn't run across <laughs> yeah. the field. Was you, you, you were there. You were technically yeah. on the field yeah. for the game. Yes. yes. All right. Sorry, Gina. That's okay. Uh, listen, I, I won in... Do it with hopes held you high did. You did. as well. You absolutely I just did. Wanted to know why so many psychics. It's a part of my childhood. They're working with psychics. That's and what he said. He said that's what they used to do. But it DNA never replaced psychic calls. Yes, I would. I would say yes. Gypsy ladies having feelings versus DNA right. Right. analysis. I'm going to go with the DNA every time. Um, I had a uh, let's see. 
I've got some stuff to talk about here. Um, I noticed this. I don't know if you guys noticed this with your with your dog. Uh, brought it up before, but I, I noticed that when I let Phil out in the morning and he takes a dump, wherever I am, he positions his ass mm-hmm. toward me. Sure. Mm-hmm. It's essentially what you do if you wanted someone to examine your stool and you're a dog. I mean, sometimes I'm out in the patio and he'll turn and he'll line it yeah. up and he'll check the, the the compass and the angle. He'll yeah. get out of sexton, sure. find the North Star. and then do it. But there are other times where I'm standing in the kitchen just looking through the window and he then positions another 60 degrees mm-hmm. to the southwest and then takes – he's always facing his dump. His face – I look at his tail and yeah. his ass and, and the dump. It's firing at you. It's firing at me, but he does not – take the same process when it comes to taking a leak taking a leak he goes perpendicular he just comes across Mm. he he doesn't seem to have a direction for the leak the leak is just i'm outside i'm taking a leak he doesn't lift his leg he'll just come across but when it comes to the duke he will position himself have you guys heard the wives tale that uh, or the adage or whatever uh that the dog always faces north when they're doing their business mm. easily disproven well <laughs> the other one that i was thinking of because we've been puppy sitting for three weeks and i read this somewhere and i never stopped thinking about it like the dolphins raping people dogs poop in alignment with the earth's magnetic field but that could also be again easily disproven dog shit yeah just walk your dog poop <laughs> for a few days but, but you're saying it's personal i think it is Oh, it's an attack, I see. Yeah, because it doesn't matter where he is, he'll find it. And the poop is phasing out. Right. Yeah. That's that's what I'm saying. Is that his way of trying to make it easier for the help you to clean it up? Like, here you go, here it oh, is. Oh, I think he's being courteous. I think yeah. he's being passive aggressive. That, yeah. Well, we've I, met Phil. I think this he's is... He's not aggressive, here's so what he must I be think passive you. aggressive. I read somewhere that um, dogs poop in a certain direction because that's when they're at their most vulnerable and if they trust you to watch their back, oh. that's why they do it. No. That's like Charlie that's sleeps the best when my, my arm's like he's next to me on the couch for the bed or whatever. My arm's like over his genitals. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like that's like the dog's yes. instinct. Yeah. Not my hand, not my okay. arm. Champ will always look at me. He'll look me dead in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> I love it's, that it's little shit. scamp. Yeah. He'll go <laughs> perpendicular to me. Mm-hmm. But so like tr- I but, see his side of his body. his head. But Maybe. he will look... But maybe it's yeah. the novelty of a guy smoking and eating tacos <laughs> that's <laughs> captured his imagination. It. Looking, can't good, looking good, Dad. <laughs> Check out what I'm doing. I'd like one of those things. Um, so Phil does that. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's because he thinks I have his back. Yeah, he's got yeah, his got, you got a six. I got a six. Yeah. Maybe the flying knee <laughs> will cure that. I mean, not in the first time, but eventually he'll get the message. Interesting. And then he'll want to keep his eyes. That's right. On his 12. If this is true, me. then something tells me he, he repositions himself when Olga's around. Because mm. he oh, yeah. will get a swift kick in the ribs. I should talk to Olga yeah, about find what out. direction Goes Phil's around. anus is. Also, on that, uh, on that note, out in front, they have these little signs posted in the lawns of the houses around the studio that... Uh, Little cardboard signs that say "Please be respectful," and it's got yeah. the dog. Oh, those are all over Bobo. Making, Every house. making the duty on the on the lawn. Um, I I get that people need a heads up, but isn't that just sort of woven into the social fabric? Like, hey, just don't let your dog shit on other people's lawns. Apparently but, not. On, um, on the on the landscaping, which we're looking at, I understand that poops is going to sit there and get gross or whatever. On the plants, that's feeding the plants, right? Mm. That kind of mulch. Mm. That's a lazy person's excuse. I, I'm not that person, but I'm saying. I, yeah, I, but the problem is the dogs get a don't fence, really. You cheap ass. They don't really <laughs> shit in the shrub. They just find a little opening. But either way, but fucking bag it. Uh, but no, what it. I what I was looking at with these pictures, which I see all over the place, is. It says, uh, please be respectful. Thank you. And it's got the dog squatting with the universal slash to it. I don't know that I need the miniature yeah, dog the, shit. The, the pile of poop. I don't need the pile of poop. I know what he's doing. I like it. I like the way it brings it home. <clears throat> now, I feel like uh, it's forcing me to think about animated mm. poop. It yeah. is. that I, It's supposed to. We all know what's going on here. There's no need for that. Yeah, I feel I'm with Brian. I, I don't think I have delicate sensibilities. Please I'm don't just, let your dog sit on my lawn. No. And pl- by the way, you save the ink on the dog shit. <laughs> 
and every twenty third sign you get a free sign worth true. of ink. You true. know what I mean? That's I mean true. it's it's you would it's a savings, yeah. and it could also be passed along to the consumer because then the price would go down <laughs> of, of the these signs. signs significantly. Of the sign, significantly. It's a good point. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I've passed this sign a million times and well, I thought, I don't need fake poo. I've been going to the dog park every morning. I get woken up at 5.55 a.m. Mm. Didn't know there were two 5.55s in a day. Mm. And I go to the dog. I'm a dog park person now. And oh my God, peep, if you're not coached up, the people will come after your ass. And I say, good. You watch your dog. And if the dog poops, you hightail oh, it really? over and you get. But That's if somebody, the social protocol. Absolutely. I'm loving. I think the dogs are teaching the the residents of the valley a lot when it comes to common courtesy. Okay. I'm really enjoying this experience. Well, what I'm glad. When, what happens when you encounter like the dog? Does anyone bring their dog there who's a little antisocial or Yes. Or like- they, and they they fucking round them up. And carry him out on a rail. Oh, really? Because they have the big dog park and then a, a sign that literally says, for small and timid dogs oh. only. But here's where these fuckers find the loophole. They have big, scary dogs that are afraid of big, scary dogs, but, but they like the to dogs, bully yeah. the little dogs. And boy, we go voice. after them. Oh. Is this your dog? Is this your dog? He tried to bite my... Yeah, take yeah. care of this. Yeah, this isn't this isn't the park where you're, that you're supposed to be in. Yeah, wow. no, this is small. Excuse you. I, I am very... I'm like, I get dog people all of a sudden. Like, fuck that. This little furry guy is just trying to play. He doesn't want to be eaten. Maybe... You guys don't go to dog parks maybe, because you're rich and you have yards. Maybe renters <laughs> shouldn't be allowed to own pets because this is a recipe for disaster. But this is how you socialize them. Right? This is how you socialize the residents in it, North Hollywood. I wouldn't know you to have a fence. <laughs> then it's back to the shit box with no light. Oh, um, it's been fun. The uh, also, uh, well, speaking of that, I was, um, I got this, uh, I, there, I had a bill, I've been ha- sitting on this Bill Maher clip for a couple of weeks now, but I thought it was pretty interesting. And it's um, Bill Maher talking about presentism. Hmm. Which is um, not familiar. What is that? It? It's a new thing where we decide. It's kind of like everyone who was born before us was bad because right. they used these oh. terms, or they owned a slave, or slaves, or they acted in such a way toward women. It's a very interesting way to pass through life, which is we just go ahead and sit around now and go. Yeah, I'm for gay marriage. And then you go, my grandfather wasn't. Oh, he's a bad guy. Yeah. It's like, no, that's just not the way so that's not the way society works. And I don't I've never seen this. I hope I'm not stepping on the clip by saying that be careful throwing those stones, twenty twenty two. Because slippery slope in thirty years, all the yeah. shit that we're doing it that we didn't realize. It doesn't take a lot of brain power to re- do the math on yeah. you know twenty years down the road. And also it does make you realize like when we were Going nuts, tearing down statues. Like, what is that going to? I mean, we're going to look crazed. No. It's not. It's not wrong headed. You know what I mean? We're going to look like insane yeah. children who are throwing tantrums in parks and streets. Yeah. Like that's how we're going to come across the future generations. It's not going to be sort of wrong headed or misplaced something. It's going to be. We're going to look insane. Crazed. All right. Sorry. Crazed. Go ahead. Well, there you go. Yeah. Speaking the truth. This is why I'm constantly wondering, beside the people in the live studio audience, who is supporting Bill Maher these days? Because I know a lot of people on the left being like, fuck that guy. So, and then a lot of people on the right are like, I don't know. So I like him. Who's like, who are we? People Where, you on know the what I right mean? are just like cherry picking. They go, I disagree with Bill Maher about a bunch of stuff, but uh, I saw his mm. monologue and uh, he's right on, you yeah. know, it's right with that. Like it, there's a, um, there's less of uh, probably, I know from like guys like, I don't know, Dennis Prager, you know what I mean? There's nobody on the left who de- who cherry picks things he says. Like, you know, I don't disagree with him on abortion stuff, but he's kind of right about mm-hmm. this whole kid stuff and whatever, whatever the stuff, they won't parse it out. They'll just go, he's bad because the difference is, is people on the right don't think Bill Maher is bad. 
They think he's right about this and wrong about that. Or maybe he's wrong about 10 things and right about this. And I think they kind of feel the same way about, I don't know, Anderson Cooper or Don Lemon. They don't go, that's a bad dude. They just go, he's wrong about X, Y, or Z. Even though he's on the wrong network. Yeah, but then if he'll say something, they'll go, oh, he's right about this. Mm-hmm. Um if you're the folks on the left paint the people on the right as bigoted and homophobic and Good you know wh- whatever there's you're a bad person right. so you wouldn't you know you don't go well Hitler made a point <laughs> you know like you just go bad as a bad person yeah. and then so the problem is is once you get into the ad hominem stuff then you can't agree with anything because you can't agree with anything coming from a bad right. bigoted person right. you know and I think uh, I think I think the right looks at Bill Maher's kind of Hollywood pothead, but funny and smart and wrongheaded on things. And then, oh, but he's got this right. Yeah. That's uh, I buy that it. at least seems to be what I hear. Footnotes of the whole thing. I recently saw The Woman King. I don't know if you guys are familiar no, with I haven't this seen movie. it, but I, I hear that. 94% yep. with the critics, 99% with the people. Damn. There's a real crowd pleaser. People are really loving this movie. Is it a crowd pleaser? Yes. I don't think it's fantastic but it's, it's objectively a good movie i can see how people would love it it's got a lot of great action and practical effects too um not like a lot of cgi it's a lot of like actual fighting choreographed cool fighting footnote to that uh, a big plot line in the movie is how like uh, the uh, viola davis's tribe uh in the uh, in the movie actually helps the uh the european trade uh slave traders you know what i mean get their prisoners of war become slaves huh wait so Val, Viola, Viola Davis, Davis is, is the titular woman. She's king. the woman king. She's but, the woman king. So is she helping the slave trade? No, her, her, she's not the king. Like the actual guy who rules the, the the tribe. They're um, prisoners of war. When they go to war and they capture a hundred people, they then turn them over or have some sort of arrangement with European slave traders. Oh, I thought they were fighting against the nope. slave traders. Interesting. Nope. Interesting. I mean, eventually that kind of becomes part of the story, but that's not the the plot. Yeah, because I heard historically that's what that tribe yeah. did. It's a uh, good movie. It's I, it's not you know fantastic, great best picture stuff, but it's good. I somebody tweeted me that it was like ninety four and then like ninety nine amongst the people, and they think there's some thing going on with the people now. But I, would, I don't know what it is. I would doubt. I mean, it's it's a. It's a it's a popular theme, right? Like you know, women doing it for themselves, about ass kicking women. The whole poster. Well, women. that that works always with the critics but right. oftentimes then drops for the people mm. yeah it's a, it's a it's got great action it's a fun movie it's a little long but i can see 99 seems a little high but not in the 90s seems perfectly justified for this movie like we will look people. back yes, in, yes. in 10 years and be like yeah that was 90 that was a 90 movie yeah for, especially with the people like i said it's yeah. got great it's almost entirely action throughout right. really well choreographed action not overwhelming cgi kind of mind-numbing it's a good movie i can see why it would be in the 90s with both it seems justified to me i don't know if there's any way to game the people system Yeah, how would you even do that well, i guess you could create a bot well the something. way you motivate people to shit on something i can you motivate people to celebrate something I'd heard no this. i mean like I like if you were pissed off at a restaurant and you wanted to give get your right, friends to do a bunch yeah, of bad well, reviews yeah, yeah. or something I mean. on it i don't know a subject for maybe tomorrow but somebody tweeted me something it was a long thing i didn't really get into it but it was in it was it was interesting we'll see if it holds any water or not first let me tell you about simply safe nothing matters more than the safety of you and your loved ones but old school home security companies use outdated technology overcharge you and lock you into a multi-year contract you don't want that that's why i use simply safe i trust simply safe this uh, they've been they've been on board for over a decade with us, uh, you don't have to pull wires. You don't have to drill holes, um, peel and stick. The batteries last up to 10 years. Very ergonomically sound design. 24-7 professional monitoring. Simply Safe's agents dispatch a police, first responders. They do it the moment a threat is detected, even if you're not home or cannot be reached. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com. Slash Adam. Save 20% when you sign up for free interactive monitoring and get your first month free. Visit simplysafe.com slash Adam to learn more. There's a no safe like simply safe. All right. Actor and author and former 
gangster, Irish mm. gangster, Richie Stevens is going to be in studio right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Ace man, Mike from Seattle, got a rich man, poor man for you. Not having a 401k. Love the show. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. So Richie Stevens is in studio. Uh, We talked about the book, The Gangster's Guide to Sobriety, My Life in 12 Steps, put together by my friends, uh, Al Chuler and Krinsky. Guys, ooh, kind of behind uh, Silicon Valley and uh, King of the Hill and all a whole bunch of interesting projects. I've worked with them on stuff and they found Richie. How did you find them, Richie? Yeah, I sent them a cold email. <laughs> they didn't know me from, from Adam. Based on what? So um, I was helping out a friend, another actor buddy of mine, and he had written a comedy and he wanted me to like see if I could get some producers attached and you know, those were, they're like the top comedy guys at the time because they had Silicon Valley. So I just sent them an email and said, hey, we've got a cool project. Would you like to work on it? <laughs> and then that one didn't go anywhere. And then uh, John said, I like you guys. Keep sending me stuff. So I sent him a couple of other ones. And then I sent him my book that I had been working on. And we partnered up and rewrote the book. And here we are. Um, I tell everyone it's, it's, it's not rocket science show business. You gotta, you gotta reach out, you gotta show up, you gotta send emails, you have to physically show up, you have to have meetings. Like you do that. And these pipe dreams aren't really dreams. They're just you beginning a process. You started out in Ireland, right? Yeah. Um, born and raised in Ireland. I moved to America when I was 22 and Got married re- really young, and I was a, a wild man when I was younger, and uh, I had a bit of a problem with the old uh, drugs and drinking, and, you know, one thing led to another, and uh, I got sober in 2010, and I was a construction dude as well. I was, I was like a drug dealer, and I was in a gang, but I was a carpenter, and I broke my back in an accident in 2011, and then that was the end of my carpentry career, and... Then I became a model and then an actor, and here what, I am. <laughs> what kind of carpentry did you do? Oh, boy, here, here we, we go. go. I did framing and some finish work. Oh, there. shit. Brian, you want to step outside with me? Real yeah. carpenter. Carola's excited. <laughs> Ty Pennington-style carpenter. Uh, well, I, I'm what you call an Aer Lingus carpenter, one of those guys who came over on the plane and learned it on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we go any further, I've got Let's to apologize to everybody. <laughs> All right, I won't get into top plates and bottom plates and... Jack studs and headers and trimmers and things of that nature. I'll spare everyone that. But you took the cliched uh, carpentry to modeling route. Yeah, yes. it's a tale as old as time. <laughs> yeah, I should have gone that direction. Did uh, so life in a gang. Um, you're about as white as you get, mm-hmm. features wise, color tone. <laughs> Uh, What kind of gang did you join up when you got to San Francisco? Well, when I was back in Ireland, I was in Irish gangs. And then uh, I ended up in an Asian gang. And uh, I didn't even realize that was funny until I talked to John. (laughs) And John was like, "Um, you're in an Asian gang? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, but you're not Asian. I was like, I know. He goes, well, how'd you end up in an Asian gang? And I was like, well, they had the best cocaine. (laughs) (laughs) I used to to buy buy my uh, coke off these guys and... At the time, I was um, I was getting my my bulk supply off an Irish gangster. We'll call him the Pony. Mm-hmm. So the Pony had crappy coke, and I used to get my my good coke off uh, these Asians. And then yeah. one day I had the brainwave. I was like, Why don't I get my coke off you? And then they were like, You can only get it on one condition. And I'm like, What's that? And they said, Well, once you start selling our coke, you're not allowed to buy it off anybody else. And I was like, Why? Brand loyal. Yeah. yeah. Well, he said, because we have good stuff, and if you start selling crap under our name, then it'll ruin our wow. reputation. Smart. Oh. Yes. And he's like, but once you start buying it off us, um, you have to, you, you, you're not allowed to get it off anybody else, and if you rat on us, we'll kill your whole family. Sure. And I was like, okay, I've never ratted on anybody <laughs> before, but, uh, and I won't start now. And he's like, if you're ever arrested, keep your mouth shut, and a lawyer will be provided for you. And then... He said, but if anybody messes with you, we'll be up there with machine guns. So 
So. Ah, <laughs> I like then, these guys. Were they, are these uh, Chinese, Japanese, or just a general Asian gang? <sighs> I don't think I should be too specific about them because the lawyers maybe change all the names and everything, mm. and these boys are still at large, so I don't, I don't want to be too specific about these Let me take this for them. Fellas. I'm pretty sure they were <laughs> Laotian. Laotian. How's that? Well, the main dude, Ronald, he was American, but then we had another guy called Leroy, and he was like off the boat. Mm-hmm. Didn't, didn't wear shoes or socks when he was driving. Wow. We really? just don't know which yeah. boat. Wielded a katana blade? Right. Uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> How was, uh, what years was this with the cocaine? Um, so I got to America in 2005 and I was good for a couple of years. I was just a user. And then around recession time, 2007, 2008, I, I got back into the, uh, the, um, sales of it. The supply side. Yeah. Yeah. And I got sober in 2010. So yeah. What was a gram of Coke going for back then? So the crappy stuff was 50 bucks, but the good stuff was 60. No. Oh, no, that's seems like a good It's like at Applebee's. The half salad is 13, <laughs> right. but the full salad's 15. Yeah, yeah just a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, see, me and cocaine, I was like doing construction, making eight or nine bucks an hour, and Coke was 120 a gram or something. Mm-hmm. And it just wasn't financially Mm-mm. feasible Mm-mm. to make $8 an hour and do cocaine. <laughs> But there were still guys that would do it. I mean, I always thought that was the saddest thing ever. Like, you would toil in the sun. I mean, up on a roof scraping shingles in this kind of weather for eight hours, you'd get 90 bucks and you'd buy a gram of cocaine and it'd be done within five minutes. Uh, I mean, it was like literally a day's, you know, 10 hour day doing construction could go up your nose in yeah 45 minutes or an evening or whatever, whatever it was, was I, I I remember like thinking about that, about uh, anchor steam beer as well. Like a a six pack of anchor steam was like 13 bucks or something. I was like, no way. (laughs) That's two hours of me digging for that six pack. Like I would break everything down that way. It's, it's a sad way to go through life. When I was doing it, was about two hours work at that time. Yeah. Two hours work for well, a yeah. 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 yeah, well, the problem is when you get used to it, then it's like once you pop, you can't stop. That's the problem. If was you, the, uh, the Coke, by the way, if anyone said shitty Coke and good Coke, there's a difference, man. Mm-hmm. I had a friend. Gina, what is it? I don't know. I wouldn't know. I had a friend who worked in Miami. Oh, boy. One time he returned with the good version of it, and I was like, oh, this is what people are talking about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do they do with the cheap Coke? Step on it? Uh, yeah, they step on it. Like, the good Coke is kind of, um, they call it fish scale. It's kind of shiny, and uh, you got to break it off the rock, but uh, the crappy stuff is kind of powdery. It's like sand. and Baby laxative mm-hmm. yeah. The $10 difference between the crappy stuff and the good stuff blows my mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, why, yeah. would you, why would you, what reason is there to not? Yeah, well, the, what I realized when I started selling the good Coke was that people will pay more for the good Coke. I used to get the stuff from the Pony, and it was like, it would be so hard to shift it, and then I got the good stuff, and then it was gone every week. Who yeah. are the customers? Yeah, people at the bar, other construction guys. And are they usually buying a gram? Yeah, it varies. I used to sell Viagra as well, so I'd sell Coke and Viagra. Don't mix those up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are, are, are so much, there's so much bootleg stuff out there now, right? Like the, the pharmaceutical world? I used to buy them on the internet back then. I won't say, say what the website is because I'm not trying to encourage kids how to do mm-hmm. it, but I used to just order them off the internet and they'd come in the mail and... But back then, in the early days of Viagra, there was no generic. So are you actually getting like Viagra and selling it, or is it someone, some third party making their version? I think it was a, uh, a generic one. I don't think it was real deal. Oh. But it worked. Yeah. It's got the same <laughs> active ingredient, right? Um, yeah. I don't know. I know there's a whiskey dick. Do you get a Coke dick? Yeah, you do. That's why I was. Oh, that's with the Viagra. Like, yeah, that was the problem. Like you know, some fellas would, they'd, they'd be looking to hook up with some some dolls, and they'd, they'd have that problem. So then I would have the solution for the oh, problem as well. Oh, Doctor, yeah. wow, get them coming and going, <laughs> like the boss selling "I hate the boss" T-shirt. That's right. He sells the beer and the coaster. Mm-hmm. So you uh, you end up getting strung out yourself. You end up getting sober in 2010. Mm-hmm. How do you get sober? Oh, well, it was like my maybe my fifth suicide attempt. 
Oof. I was like a lunatic back then. And make a long story short, I had a hit out on somebody and, and I didn't kill him, thank God. But uh, yeah, basically I was working with these other sober Irish guys and, uh, you know, I, I knew they went to the 12-step meetings and they knew I had a problem. And this one guy, his name was Bernard, or Americans would say Bernard. So Bernard was this tough old Irish guy and he gave me his number one time and he, he says, if you ever want to get sober, give me a call. <laughs> and, and for some reason, after that last uh, last suicide flirtation, I gave him a call, and he started bringing me to the twelve step meetings, and and I I just went all in with it, and then I had to like leave the gang and tell the boys I'm not going to be taking this coke every week, and I'm sober now. And how'd they feel about that? I was kind of worried because uh, yeah. my main guy Ronald, I told him over the phone, and then he wanted to meet me, so I was kind of worried about that because he usually never wanted to meet me, and. I had told them the story and, you know, I was afraid that they might kill me because I knew about the workings of their their organization. And he told me to come meet him on a Saturday and it was in, I think it was in the Richmond where I was living and, and uh, he ca- he got into my truck and uh, and I, I was like, oh, is this it? And <laughs> I hopped in and, and I was all nervous and the radio was on, Oasis was on, Champagne oh, yeah, Supernova. Was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Salvation. Yeah. And he got, <laughs> he got in and, and uh, he was like, oh, I'm all about Oasis. And I was like, oh, okay. He's hardly going to shoot me in the back of the head <laughs> if he's talking about Oasis at the same time. And then I reiterated what I said, you know, I was like, look, I have a problem with this. I can't, I can't be sober and keep on selling drugs because... Part of the deal of going to the meetings is you got to be good. Mm. You can't be breaking the law. You got to be honest, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, he, he just wanted to look me in the eye. And he said, um, you know, you're a good guy. Uh, you were always straight with us. And if you have a problem, you're doing the right thing. And I was like, oh, okay, wow. cool. And then he said, I want to buy your customers off you. And <laughs> I was like, you can have them. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, uh, I don't <laughs> yeah. And he was like, no, uh, you don't have to see anything. You don't have to touch it, anything. I'll, I'll give you residual income every week. You wow. know, it's free money. And I was like, no, you can have them. <laughs> I, don't, wow. I don't really want anything to do with it. And uh, I was like, if any of the boys call me, I'll, uh, I'll put them in touch with you. But uh, I don't, thanks, but no <laughs> thanks. He wanted your Rolodex. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, a few of the, the the guys who were really bad, like I had a problem, you know. But there was some of my customers who were even worse than me. Like like when I was selling to them, I would be feeling bad, and I'd be like, "You better fucking cop your cell phone, or I'm gonna stop selling to you." You know, like like I would I would come to their their place, and they would be like really messed up. And then I was like, I should try and get these guys sober now, you know. And uh, one of them, he was like, a, he was a gardener for the city of San Francisco. And uh, he called me up looking for coke after I got sober. And I went over to the house, like, and he's like, where's the stuff? And I'm like, I don't do it anymore. There's these <laughs> meetings you can go to, and, uh, and then you don't, have to, you don't have to get high anymore. You know, they show you how to do it. And, and yeah, we don't have to get high anymore. And he looks at me, and he goes, I don't have a problem. <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah, you do. And he goes, no, I could stop anytime I want. Sure. You, you go to your meetings. <laughs> You know, hmm. yeah, and and I was like, "Fuck!" I kind of realized I had a problem. I thought everybody else would realize mm-hmm. it too when I told them, but uh, it doesn't so you, work like that. You didn't say to anyone, "I know where you can get some coke. Come with me to this church basement." <laughs> <laughs> you say the guy was a gardener with this city of uh, San Francisco. Uh-huh. I think if you said that with your Irish accent, <laughs> and uh, it would work for me saying, "How gay is this guy?" And then you'd go, <laughs> he's gayer than the gardener of the city of San Francisco. I Let, like let's it. see if we can try okay. this. You ready? You want me to do a gay version of him? No, no, no do what, you do the Irish version. It'll, oh, yeah. it'll sound. How gay was this guy? He was actually straight. Oh. <laughs> yeah, all right. No. You got to go there. You got to go to the <laughs> ground. Ask me. Right? Ask me. I'll right. ask you. Uh, Gina, how gay was this guy? <laughs> he was gayer than the groundskeeper in San Francisco. All right, gardener. No, I tried. Uh, well, that's I tried. Not, that's not <laughs> yeah, bad. Sorry. All right, roll well, lesson, role playing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so Can I ask you, a delicate yes. question? Were you, I, I mean this respectfully, were you bad at suicide or were these half hearted attempts? Uh, you know, I think there was someone looking out for me because every time I tried it, someone else would stop me. Like the first time I tried it, I was about 19 and um, I had. Uh, I had a hundred ecstasy pills oh and I was dating this girl. We broke up. I was really sad about it. And um, I, was, I drank like two bottles of Jack Daniels 
And the more I drank, the, uh, the more I thought, fuck it, I'll just kill myself. And um, I ended up taking 30 ecstasy. And uh, at that time I was going to go ahead with it. But the fella who was living with me, he saw what I was doing. I was like putting out cigarettes on my arms and all kinds of mm. bad. Like, and uh, the guy I was living with, he, he hid the other 70 pills and he saved my life that time. And then each, Did you have to go to the hospital? No. I was like all fucked up. I was like, you know, but I, I lived, wow. <laughs> you know. And then o- other times it was like similar stuff. It would be just so weird that like somebody else stopped me. Another time I was, I was, go- was going to shoot myself and uh, I, I had my gun. I, c- I couldn't find my bullets. And I was looking because if you're a responsible gun owner, you're supposed to store the bullets separately from the gun. Mm-hmm. But uh, I was awake for days. I was on loads of coke and drinking and and then I was like, fuck it, I'll just kill myself. And uh, I was looking for my bullets, and the wifey came into the room and saw, saw what I was doing. She took the gun, ran out of the house, and saved my life. Like, Well, back to Brian's part, point. Living in San Francisco <laughs> with the Golden Gate Bridge right there. <laughs> I mean, mean, surely. One time I was going to do the Golden that. Gate. Yeah, one time uh, I actually, you know, I was a criminal, but I was a carpenter. And, yeah. Uh, you know what? You know like what Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if Jesus was a criminal, but I was doing a, a side job at the weekend. You know, one of my buddies, he said, have a side job for you. It's out of fortune tellers up on Laguna Honda in San Francisco. I was like, what do they want? They want you to build like a dividing wall. I was like, okay. So I went to do it and I was, I was on like a mad binge all week. So I was feeling like really low, all depressed and everything. And I came into this fortune tellers and I was building the wall like I was like, cutting my plates, measuring them, fucking nailing them down, put my studs in. And, like, I'm thinking while I'm working, I, I think I'll go for the bridge after, you know, mm. just fucking jump off the bridge. So I was thinking, nah, because up at the Golden Gate, there's a, there's a net in certain areas. Mm-hmm. So if you jump in the wrong spot, you land in the net. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking, fuck, no, on my luck, I'll only land in the net. <laughs> and then I was like, you know what? I could just go there and shoot myself on the bridge. Nobody ever does that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was... Needlessly elaborate. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm using my nail gun and, you know, cutting my two by fours while I'm thinking of this. And the fortune teller, she was watching me while I was working. And she comes up to me and she goes, oh, my God. You have a wonderful aura. And I, I, and, and I was glad in my death, and it was so ridiculous. I just laughed out loud, and that kind of snapped me out of it for the day. Huh. It was wow. so, so weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the book, which uh, is now looking to become a TV story, mm-hmm. series, movie. Yeah. I don't know where, I don't know what to call anything anymore. I used to just go, they're making it into a movie, but then mm-hmm. they'll make it into a series limited or a limited series. Limited series. What, how's that? going so far so good we've a few people interested and um john's and john is in the driving seat with that i, I kind of i leave it up to him he's made a lot of tv shows and i haven't made any so any <laughs> so. thoughts about playing yourself yeah i, I would like to I, I don't mind i'm flexible i can play somebody else too doesn't <laughs> matter i'm you see a lot of the story happened when i was in my 20s like so i'm you're aged out i'm aged yeah. out out of that maybe but but uh, we'll see Let's well, see. maybe one of the Asian henchmen in the gang or something right. like yeah, that. that might work. I actually had a whole head of hair, but I'm, I'm working on a show at the moment and they scalped me, so <laughs> I should have hair back. What are you working on where they uh, shaved your head? Mayor of Kingston. What is that? Yeah, it's a show on Paramount Plus uh, with uh, Jeremy Renner. Oh, oh, yeah, oh Mayor, yeah, Mayor of Kingstown. Yeah. Right. Oh. Mayor of Kingstown. Yeah, oh, I yeah, haven't so, seen it. <laughs> yeah, I'm nice. back and forth to Pittsburgh for that at the moment. What are you playing in that? I'm not allowed to say anything about my character, but you can probably guess if you see my see what I look like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm probably not going to be uh, a charity Cancer survivor. Worker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it, it, you look good with the shaved head. Yeah. It, it works. Yeah, it makes me look more thuggish. Most folks I, they, can't I pull that off. A whole head of hair. Oh my before. god, it's young Tom Hardy. <laughs> that yeah, was you last look, year you I took pe- that photo. You look beautiful with the full head of hair, but it, it, the bald works, uh, works as well. Kind of edgy, sexy. Soccer mm-hmm. hooligan. Right. Mm-hmm. 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 Can we talk about the transition from all this into the glamorous world of modeling and, and yeah, shows sure. and acting? I mean, how, how the hell? Okay, so after I got sober, I wanted to just be a contractor because I had spent a good lot of, lot of years as a carpenter. And I lear- even though I was high a lot of the time, I learned a lot of shit. I, and, and I was good. Even though I was a coke head, I always had work, you know. And um, that's what my plan was. I was just going to frame houses around San Francisco. And uh, I was working on a job. It's a good time to do it. Yeah. I was working on a job uh, in the mission in 2011. We were doing a remodel. 
and uh, it was an existing structure and we were putting in a big beam in, underneath and the beam fell down and hit me and knocked me off the scaffold and I Glue broke lamb. <laughs> yeah, I broke. Power lamb. What kind of big beam? It was a big old power lamb but it was like it was a heavy baby. It was like about the weight of a, of a piano mm-hmm. and, and it, it fell, hit me on the shoulder, knocked me off the scaffold and uh, I broke one of my discs and herniated one. And again, a bunch of operations on my back and they said it's permanently damaged. You can't be carpenter anymore. So then I was like, fuck. And uh, the guy I was working for, he fired me and, and, uh, and I lost all my savings. And I was like, shit, I need to find something new to do. And I went to a meeting one night and uh, this doll that I knew, um, she goes, oh, my God, you should be a model. And I, I was like, huh? I was 30 at that point, And, you know, these are bite marks on my nose. And, <laughs> you know, it's this is a big tooth. <laughs> right. Like, I was like, I don't think I'm model material, but I was desperate and I had no money. <laughs> So uh, I sent off some pictures and I got signed to like a shitty little uh, modeling agency and I was doing that for a while. And uh, and there's like a modeling website called Model Mayhem and I had my shit on there and a director saw my picture and he had like a, he was doing a low budget gangster movie and he asked me to, to be in it. And um, he was, they were looking for like a German hitman. <laughs> And he goes, don't take this the wrong way, but you have that look about you. <laughs> and I didn't want to scare him or anything. I was like, oh, really? Oh, oh okay. So I, I didn't really tell him I used to be one. Like, <laughs> and then I did that, that one role, and I was like, fuck, I really like this. Uh, I'm going to try and be an actor now. And I, you know, I went to different schools, and I did like some smaller, low-budget shows, and then the shows got bigger, and then I moved to L.A., and here I am. Peaky blinders, peaky blinders. Is your... Uh How's your family? What do they know about you and this? Uh, well, the family back home, they knew about it. Like, um, I put them through a lot, obviously. But they're happy I'm sober now and I'm not misbehaving anymore. And I have a couple of kids. Like, and my kids didn't know anything about it. Because like, when I got sober, my son was five and my girl was three. So like, they just know good daddy. So then, <laughs> so then I wrote the book and, the, and I got the book deal and I was like, fuck, I got to tell them about this before it comes out in the news. Like, so, you know, I, I started to tell them some stories like, you know, about the kidnapping and drug trafficking and all this kind of stuff. And they're like, wow, daddy, we had no idea you used to do this stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but it's very bad. And I'm lucky I'm not in jail. And you guys should never, ever do anything like this. How'd the kidnapping work? Oh, so we, we didn't kill him. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> so I was like 19 at the time when I was in this Irish gang back home. And uh, I was always an addict from when I was young, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, what happens if you're an addict, you, you, you make a bad dealer because you're your own best customer. So leader of our gang was this guy called Tomo. And I owe Tomo a bit of money um, because he would keep giving me hundreds of ecstasy and I would end up taking most of them myself or giving them away or this kind of stuff. And there was another guy called Travis. Like, we were just teenagers, but he was, like, in his 30s. He was kind of a hippie guy. And uh, Tomo sold him a few kilos of hash. And then Travis just, like, decided to keep the money, just stop answering the phone, you know. (laughs) And then, you see, Tomo had got his stuff on credit from a bigger dealer called Smiling Pat, and he's called Smiling Pat because if you're Irish, you know a lot of Pats, and he smiled a lot. Mm-hmm. So, so Pat's looking for his money because Tomo got the drugs on credit from him, and so he's, like, ringing them up, and he's, like, putting power tools on the phone, like drills mm-hmm. and saws, and say, you're, you're going to get this if I don't get the money. So I owed money to Tomo, and Travis owed money to Tomo, and, he, and so Tomo says, Mush, if you, help, if you help me kidnap Travis, I'll write off your debt. And his, fo- his family will pay the fucking money. So I'm like, okay, but only if you don't kill him. He goes, mush, I promise, swear to God, I won't kill him. So I'm like, okay. So then we had to, had to kidnap this guy, and, and uh, I had to spot him and follow him and, and basically let the boys know where he was. Like, and they came down from Dublin, and you see, Tomo had a different crew as well of ex-cons who were older than, than me. Like, but they used to like, follow him around. He was like a 19-year-old kid and all these older gangsters. He, he was smart, like, you know. So these other guys, uh, they kidnapped uh, Travis and brought him up to Dublin. And first he was saying that his family had no money. And, uh, and then Tomo just comes in with some trash bags. And he's like, Mush, you get the fucking money or you're going into the fucking bin bag. <laughs> and then that kind of done it. And then he rang his family. His family drove up to Dublin, paid the money. And then plus interest and each of the kidnappers' fees and what I owed. 
And then wow. the mother came up with the money. And, and How's uh, that conversation? Hey, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the end, Tomo went to get the money. And, uh, you know, he put a scarf, one of those Arab scarves around his head so they couldn't see his face. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, they, they met her at a, at a parking lot. And then she's like, please don't hurt Travis. And he's like, Mush, I don't know nothing about it. I'm just here to get the money. <laughs> and then she gave the money and then they let him go. And that was the end of it. How much money were we talking about? Uh, the kilos were probably about six and a half grand, so probably about eight and a half grand altogether. That was pounds before we had the euro. It is crazy. I was just talking to Mark Gergos about this. Somebody hired a hitman, a neighborhood. Someone in our neighborhood hired a hitman for something. <laughs> it's always, it's exquisitely cheap. I mean, this is, this, this was 20 grand. Oh my God, it's exciting. <laughs> that's on the high end. This should be the uh, most expensive thing. Uh, Ray Carruth, uh, Panthers wideout. I mean, he got his baby mama c killed for yeah. f four, five grand or mm -hmm. something. I, it doesn't. It's. In, I mean, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna tell my son just travel around with sixty five hundred bucks, <laughs> and if anyone tries to kidnap you and or kill you like a hit, yeah. you just go hold up. Buy them yeah. out. Mm -hmm. Fit five grand. I got. I got sixty five hundred. Right. Right here. Let me just go to my car. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's 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 insultingly well, low. Much Th like the Asian gang, what happens to his reputation then? Yeah, I hitman. guess you're right. There is a reputation. I also like they had to pay the expenses of right. the kidnapper. Like there's a per like diem. Ticketmaster fee for the <laughs> for the <laughs> bunch for of the receipts kid, yeah. for the kidnapper. <laughs> yeah, the, Jesus the, Christ! And then like when you get sober, so I I got sober by going to twelve step meetings, right? And uh, so step nine is you got to make amends for all the oh, bad right. things you had. Oh, to make. yeah, I had that and, happen to me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my, mine was Margaret Cho apologizing to me. But Aww, this, I know Margaret, she's sweetheart. <laughs> yeah, but I really didn't want to. It was Guthrie. unnecessary. Aww. You're forgiven. Yeah. Unnecessary, that's right. Yeah, so anyway. Kathy Griffin's party. <laughs> so step eight, you make a list of all the people you had harmed and become willing to make amends to them. And. I got away with most of the stuff I had done, so I didn't want to go to jail. Like, So, uh, you know, I'd write out the list, and Bernard told me, he says, before you make any amends, make sure you talk to me about them, because uh -huh. you can, bad things can happen. I was like, okay. So I wrote down the list. That's your sponsor. That's Bernard, my sponsor, or right. Bernard for Americans. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, sorry, keep going. <laughs> Dawson, now you got to look for it. Uh, so, yeah, so... In, um, in the movie Billy Jack... Bernard and Bernard gets toggled back and oh, forth. The bad sure guy is B Bernard, but Billy Jack calls him Bernard. Sure, depending who you ask. Is that so, a British actor putting uh, on an American accent? Uh, Tom Laughlin is the most American actor okay. on the yeah. planet. I don't know, but I swear to God, you'll find a Bernard and a Bernard <laughs> if, if you watch the movie Billy Jack. Isn't Sorry. Leno's mm. guy Bernard? Hmm? Isn't Leno's guy Bernard? No, he's a Bernard. Oh, okay. Or at least that's right. Yeah, he's just okay. Bernard. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so what happened? So anyway, um, I was trying to decide what will be the amends for this. Cause like, how the fuck do you make amends for a kidnapping, you know? So I was like trying to think it out. And I was thinking, what's the opposite of a kidnapping? I could send him on a, a lovely vacation. Uh -huh. I, you know, I had money at that time. I was like, fuck it. I, I, that's what I'll probably do. And then I came to Bernard, like, and he says, well, what's the top of your list? <laughs> I said, uh, kidnap Travis. He goes, does that man know you had anything to do with the kidnapping? I said, no. He says, well, don't fucking say it to <laughs> him. He <laughs> says, it's probably the worst experience of the man's life. Just fucking leave him alone well, and don't fucking kidnap anyone again. <laughs> Like, so you know, don't send him on a vacation. He says, no, just fucking leave him alone and don't kidnap anyone again. <laughs> He's just this uh, Bernard or Bernard is a uh, sage. Yeah, oh, he a is. wise man. Yeah, he was. He was. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be alive only for that fella today. Well, and that's part of it, right? Like you don't make amends to someone if it's only going to make you feel better, make their life worse. Yeah, exactly. All right, uh, is Keckner here? I do not know. No. Oh, okay. All right. Did you find Bernard and Bernard? I found <laughs> I found two Bernards from Billy Jack. From Billy Jack. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm still looking for Bernard. I can't believe I found Bernard. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think Billy called them Bernard. Yeah. And then like the townsfolk or the uh, kids would call him Bernard. I think Billy's he raped Billy's girlfriend sure. by the river. Right. That's a Bernard move. Yeah. Yeah, Bernard but I think that. she <laughs> thought of him as a Bernard. Oh. I, he drove a Corvette. 
you know, he fucked around with the Indians. Total yeah. burden. What do you think was going to happen? It was not of Irish descent, okay. I, as far as I could I could tell. But uh, I remember watching that in 1972. Oh, here's here's a great Tom Laughlin. Oh. Oh, come on, Bernard. There he is. So. Bernard. Whoa. But this is America, Billy. Yeah. And his name is Bernard. I wish you would. Don't, Bernard. You don't stand oh. a chance. Wow. Maybe you just wanted him to be a Bernard. I got, got <laughs> my head's, head's gonna, spinning. I saw this when I was seven. <laughs> it's a very appropriate movie to watch when you're seven. But uh, I don't know. Did his dad, his dad was the sheriff. Did he call oh him Bernard? God, I, I can't find Watch that. all of Billy Jack right now. Scrub through Billy Jack. Oh and then while you're at it, I want to see the trial of Billy Jack. And Billy Jack goes to Washington. Hey, Keckner's here. Keckner's here. Perfect. Yeah. Lucky son. <laughs> Well, Laughlin's an Irish last name. Maybe he was born to Irish parents. Maybe Laughlin. Yeah, yeah maybe go. that's where the Bernard. We got to get to the bottom of this. I remember very clearly, though, being like eight years old going, I don't know what a fucking Bernard yeah, is. I know Bernard. what a Bernard is. <laughs> no, you know. We got to get to the bottom of this. All right, uh, Richie, a very interesting story. And, and I think hopefully we'll see it. In episodic form yeah. on one mm. of the one of the streaming platforms because uh, Al Chula and Krinsky, good guys, and uh, yeah. I, I really this is such a great it's an uplifting story is what I want to say. Yeah. Uh, the book, The Gangster's Guide to Sobriety: My Life in Twelve Steps, is out as we speak. And first, let me give you a little word about Investall. All right, let me tell you about Investall, democratizing investing. With a completely automated trading app, access strategies, hedge funds, well, the ones they use. So uh, do it like the big boys. Opt for a robo-trader that selects an expert strategy for you, or pick up four stocks or cryptocurrencies and set them on autopilot. InvestAll uses AI and forecasting to automatically rebalance your portfolio based on the current market conditions. You're using Investall, right, Chris? Yeah, and you're talking about forecasting. They have this price trend forecaster that checks any stock's current and prior momentum so you know when it's time to invest or sell out of position. It's awesome. Securely link your mortgage, credit cards, and investment accounts, including digital wallets for NFTs, to get a full picture of your financial health. Am I right, Dawson? Download InvestAll on any device, including your smartphone, tablet, laptop, or desktop now. Use promo code ADAM to receive $20 free when you deposit the minimum of $100 to start investing. All right. We will uh, take a break. We'll get to the bottom of Billy Jack. Dave Keckner's going to join us in studio. We'll do that right after this. It's time for Nicaraguan Name That Movie with Adam's buddy, Oswaldo. See if you can guess which movie this famous line is from. The name is San Diego, which I course in German, mean a word vagina. If you said Anchorman. They named it San Diego, which of course in German means a whale's vagina. You're correct. Now, back to the show. Of course, Dave Keckner knows it. From yes. Anchorman. Anchorman 2, The Office. Thank you for smoking. 40-year-old virgin. Taldiga Nights, one of my favorite scenes when uh, you're man in the bar near the track and uh, you got the jukebox stocked with uh, Pet Shop Boys. And, <laughs> and that's some jazz, I think. And some yeah. jazz. You gets really, yeah. uh, get very upset about that. <laughs> I just I love that for, formula uh, and that whole that whole scene. So good, so good. So uh, you know, yeah, Sasha Baron Cohen. I mean, he's just tops. He is top flight. He's his amazing talent. True. Yes, and and probably I'm guessing going to do a bunch of serious roles. I I I heard he was playing Freddie Mercury at some point, and I got really that? excited. And well, then he, he would have been amazing, and, right? Yes, yes. How great would he have been? That'd have been yeah. Oh well, yeah. But were you and I on the short list, long list, any list for that? No, <laughs> no, 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 no list. We couldn't do the accent. 
If that's, they, the, oh, that's the only reason. If they wrote on the back of that list, okay. my name wouldn't have made it onto that oh. list. Keckner's doing some live stand-up shows, uh, Blue Skies and Dirty Lies is the name of the stand-up tour. It's playing at the Funny Bone in Cincinnati. That'll be this Friday and Saturday. And then the Flappers coming up here in Burbank, Columbus, Ohio, Funny Bone. That'll be October uh, 7th and 8th. How are you liking getting out, getting on the road, and living the life of a stand-up? Well, you know I have five children, <laughs> so it's not a matter of like, is it? <laughs> no, it isn't. The bare necessities, I'm going to say it, not say it, because we don't want to give Disney any money. The simple bare necessities. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I dig it. I dig it because I'm, I'm, I'm also doing new material, and I, my plan is to launch a, new sh- a whole new show that I'm slowly putting into this show. You know, Adam, let me talk to performer to performer, comic to comic, how we develop our materials and then launch them in a new hour, as we like to say, Adam. We talk about developing. Of course, you could develop a new hour about every hour, I think. Now, and so, yeah, it's what I've been wanting to do for a very long time. I grew up in Missouri, as you all know, and my dad used to, take, used to take me every year to the Missouri State Fair where he displayed in the agricultural section there. Yeah, so they, you made turkey crates, right? Excuse me, sir. Oh, sorry. It's turkey coops. coops uh, are we going to take a shot at it? No. no. You're not, I, you know what I have not done is given you some literature, because hmm. you would actually appreciate this. You know, I, I started working for my dad when I was seven. Mm-hmm. And he was in a metal fabrication business, specifically livestock trailers, specifically turkey coops. Oh, mm-hmm. Now we're back on track. Where were yes. we? Anyway, uh, so I would go to the Missouri State Fair every year with my dad. He'd be there for two weeks, the hottest two weeks of the summer there in Missouri, and display in the agricultural section. Mm-hmm. And now it didn't bring the turkey because he also did farrowing crates, which I can get into if you want to really bore your listeners. Uh, then also picnic table frames, uh, uh, hay bale uh, stingers, and uh, forklifts. So he was like a metal fabricator. I dad. lost you about a minute and no, a half ago. No, I love ago. metal fabrication. Okay, thank he you. He used a TIG, he used a MIG, he used thank an you. arc welder. Well, the, this is before the TIG and the MIG. We're going back we're going back in the 70s my friend wow yeah so he's got a torch out or she got course, a stick not, out not there at the missouri state fair no, These i are, know but your I'll, dad's working with a oh, yeah. carborundum blade chop off yes, saws and of course. putting all that shit together i ran a bandsaw by the time i was 10 <laughs> jesus i'm not Christ. kidding you if an osha guy came in there fine fine <laughs> right. fine i started out uh, uh cleaning the toilets which we got to admit could have been more dangerous than anything else I did in that shop mm-hmm. because it's 10 men working there, right? Mm, yeah. All local guys. Probably didn't see the doctor much. All if somebody off the had truck. a yeah. if somebody had a case of gonorrhea, guess who might have been susceptible? Yeah, Parasite City. <laughs> right? Danger. So your dad was a blue collar dude. Oh, my worked. dad was a self made man. Did he end up taking his company and turning it into. It was, know, very, it was very, it was very, for what it was, my dad only went to eighth grade. My dad has had dyslexia and they, no one ever figured it out because my dad was born in the, the late thirties. Mm-hmm. So it was a one room schoolhouse. No one ever figured out why Cecil couldn't keep up. No, my dad had a brilliant math mind, but as far as reading goes, he, he didn't understand that, Hey, I can't read this. I don't get it because it's all jumbled. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until my sisters were older, they figured out, oh, my God, Dad can't read. And mm-hmm. then they figured out he had dyslexia. So, but by back in those days, at eighth grade, they said, see, so you, you don't need to go to high school. Mm-hmm. So imagine how devastating that is, even in a small town. Because yeah. then now everyone knows. Wait, right. I'm so, so yes, smart, I can just skip high school? Is that right. what you mean? Yeah, not hardly. And so then he went, my dad started working for his dad when he was four, and I'm not kidding him. My dad, my grandfather had uh, dairy cows, and so my dad would work for him. My dad didn't make me start working until I was seven, so he gave me yeah. a oh, three-year break. break. <laughs> So did you get in there and learn how oh, to yeah. fabricate? Well, I was yeah. Well, I was a terrible welder. Probably why I didn't stay in the business. Yeah, terrible welder. Yeah. Well, you're only nine at the time. <laughs> yep. I mean, you may have caught on by your bar mitzvah, right? I don't know if they had a lot of those in. Missouri. I didn't even know. I didn't even hear the word bar mitzvah until college. <laughs> uh, so your dad was a hardworking dude. Oh my God! Yeah, probably eight hours a week. 80 hours yeah. a week. Well, someone said he used to drink up to like 50 cups of coffee a day when he was working. And mm-hmm. then he had to finally stop that because it's irritating everything too much, including everybody else. So you got the, did you get the ethic, the work yes. ethic from Pops? I've never, never collected an unemployment check. And, and is, and 
So back to stand up, which is, um, you know, people say to me sometimes, oh, you're doing all this, you're doing all that. I go, I used to work. Yeah. This is standing around, yeah. holding the microphone and air conditioning. This is not. People clapping for you. This is not work. Yeah. yeah this at this, this isn't work. I mean, I think it's a, it's good to get that base. Like, you know what work is. You, yeah. You did it and you watched your dad do it for a long time, right? Yeah. And you hope your kids do the same thing because you watched your parents do it and you yes. think ergo oh my kids will see how much time and energy i put into this now Certainly. my kids are gonna be like yeah i saw that mike rogan on tv once so i know what work is I know. I like know. they think it's unfortunately it's impossible to pass this along because you unfortunately had to live it Right. You know, exactly no it, no exactly i, I wasn't going to do that to him because i didn't look i started working when i was seven Right. And I had to do it every day after school. I was not a happy kid. I was not happy to do that. And my, you know, later in life, you're like, oh, I can, I can drive a standard. You know, of any, you know, you, you've been in movies like, oh, oh, by the way, the last second. By the way, it's a standard. Can you drive it? Well, of right. course I can. I, I learned on a standard. My dad was going to not let me learn on an automatic, right? So things like that you appreciate, and also just, you know, you know the difference between a flathead and a Phillips screwdriver. The most simple, basic things in life, right? Yeah, I don't. I I was talking to someone a long time ago, and they said, uh, "Well, maybe your son will be a better carpenter than you." And I said, "No fucking no, way!" And no. they're like, "Why not?" And I go, "Because I did it for fifty hours a week for over a decade. You couldn't possibly. You better hope he's not right. a better carpenter. That means nothing worked out for that boy. That's right. Like." Yeah, you can't dabble. You got to yeah. you got to do Dive it in. and our kids are never really going to experience that. And we, we just hope they're going to figure out what their passion is, right? Yeah. I uh my daughter's got a lot of range. She was telling me she went to the um oh god, what's that country guys? There's a country singer just performed at the Staples Center. Just got Keith Urban? He got Matt Paisley? No, old, young school. Okay. Got uh yeah. Chris got, Stapleton? Got in a trouble for yeah. dropping some men. Oh, bombs. Morgan Wallen. Morgan Wallen oh, in a, in a the tr- drunken driveway. Right. That guy evidently has got his career back on track. So oh, she's his like, fans weren't upset. She's like, I want to see well, she's like, <laughs> I wonder I'm going to the Morgan Wallen concert, and then uh I want you to introduce me to Kanye West. And I thought, all that's right, everything. but that's a lot of range. Yeah, it's a lot of words either way. Musically, sure. right there. So. Yeah, I took my kids to meet uh, Post Malone, mm-hmm. and then immediately you get a list of here's who else I want to meet. <laughs> yeah, like, Wait yeah. a minute, we just happen to be at the same agency. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean I and can. By the way, is Jeff Ross ever on that <laughs> list? Because that's one phone call. <laughs> How about Keckner? Come on, you saw the movie. Come on, <laughs> right now. So it's the, they find out who you don't know, and then the, that's who they want to. They want you to hang out with. Yeah. So no, our kids will never do a day's work in their life, but hopefully they'll become passionate about something. So this is an interesting point. Okay. You we, announced it before you made the point. I right know. Here, I know. I'm that confident mm-hmm. about it. We were. We were compelled to work because we were desperate and we had to. We had to feed ourselves, and it was really more out of desperation. It was survival. Yes. Sur- yes. It was. It was survival. So there's two ways to compel people to do shit uh, 40 plus hours a week. One is desperation, mm-hmm. like we all had, and survival. And the other part is insane passion. So the desperation part's off the fucking table. That's, not gonna that's gone. That they're that's all been grub hub to hell. Yes. But maybe if they'll think lucky. about getting something passionate. And that's why parents uh, in our tax bracket are constantly going, I hope he finds something yeah. that he's interested in. Our parents never hoped we found anything. They just knew we would find oh. something yeah, or luck. we'd live off a of fucking top ramen yeah, for the rest of our life. You will or you won't. Not my problem. Not their problem. So we don't go. I hope he's a really fucking hard worker. We go, I hope he finds something that makes his lazy ass work. Well, I do say to my kids, you know you're spoiled, right? And they all go, yeah. But also, my son's gotten several jobs, and they're all surprised, like, oh, you're a good worker. Mm. Like, we thought because your dad's an actor, you weren't going to be a good worker. He's a good worker. Mm. And now he's going into acting, right? And Uh then the thing is, like, now how much will you really work at this? Because I've... 
I've pounded that into his head. Like, see, you and I can go up in front of 200 people and it's going to work because we open our mouths and they happen to laugh. That's success. Now, you and I are not going to walk in front of 100 people, do an acting scene, and people go, oh, my, yeah. He's Moving. not as pretty as I want him to be, but boy, he did something. You know, half of it's looks in that end of the, the bargain, right? Mm-hmm. Acting. So that's a whole different world. That's, you know, how do you, are you able to caps, encapsulate charisma, looks, and some other unknown quantity that means you so watchable? Right? Mm-hmm. That's really difficult. Well, you do have very good looking children. I do. It's oh, true. my God. It's true. Really, really it's true. stunning children. And not even bragging. It's like, wow. No, it's true. Okay, so they got half the thing yeah. done there if, if, if you live in America. Um, but real quick, I'm going to plug October 5 at Flappers because I know people here in town. I want them to come see the Office Trivia Show with the real Todd Packer. Now let's get back to it. Oh, yeah. You do the matinee show? Yes. It's the Office Trivia? And, and additive, but I'm, I'm only doing the one this. here in, in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we if we sell that one out, we'll put an extra one in there. I hope so. But it's I'm just doing that because I want to show my agents what we're doing and then get on to the, you know, the next rung of the, what that could possibly be. So how do you get from uh, helping your dad build turkey coops <laughs> to uh, the, the footlights of uh, the big city? Because well, I was a poli-sci major. Mm. Natural transition. Yeah. Natural. Here's the thing. I, when I was very young, I, like that, Tipton, Missouri, 2,000 people, three television channels, no internet. No, we didn't have cable. You had a, a limited library. I'd never met an actor. Don't know anybody, don't, you know, nearest mm-hmm. big town. Kansas City's 200 miles away. Uh, St. Louis, 225 miles away. Uh, I watched Saturday Night Live and Monty Python the same year, and I'm like, that's what I want to do. Who are you going to tell in this small town? <laughs> Nobody. We're going to share this information. Turkeys. We didn't raise birds, sir. <laughs> oh, pardon me. How dare you? I thought you had to have a couple of test yeah, turkeys, you know, check out the now, accommodations. Did we know many people that, that raise turkeys and grow out barns outside oh, yeah, of town? You of did. course we did. That's actually how my dad got in the business. But here's my dad got in the business because he's a good human. human. Their buddy, Virgil Cleather, must had his eye put out by a, uh, uh, a used of the staples for turkey, the, for hog wire, the staples you put in the, in the post, mm-hmm. flew out, took out his eye, and then it was time for birds to be loaded. And Virgil was out, so a bunch of guys from town came and helped them load birds. And my my dad's like, this is the worst rack of cages I've seen. Mm. I can build something better than that. And that's how it happened. Mm. Yeah. You know how, Adam? Good mm. works. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And Virgil, what's his last name? Clee Thermos. Clee Thermos. Virgil Clee Thermos. There of were a bunch of Germans in that town. So there's the Clee Thermoses, the Knips, Kutten Kellers, Kirkemeyers, Ketterlins, a, a bunch of them. You'd think that they would remember how to pronounce <laughs> Koshner. Oh, yeah. Koshner. It should be Koshner, of course. You look at it. Yeah, but it's not. Keckner. Well, you know, oh, I'm, only, I'm, I'm only a couple hundred miles from you because I was born, you know, I was from Kansas City. A lot oh, of, you grew up in Kansas City. I did. A lot of Knudsons. Yes, there yeah. you go. All kinds. Oh, yeah. they couldn't say Knudsen? No, Knudsons. Well, same with Knips. Yeah. Mm. We should really take a trip. <laughs> down to Tipton, Adam Carolla, walk through the cemeteries and just see the 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 uh, P- Penelope, Penelope Penelope of mm. names, the cornucopia mm. of mm. German names, mm-hmm. Schmitz. Yeah. Um, mm. Oh my God. Neustadt's. Neustadt's. We had all those. I mean, it was the same. I it's had a Dutch I German. I had an old Hoffer. Oh here. yeah, you did have an old offer. Well, That's you, true. You've yeah. got to come. When are we going? Probably Live next show. week's too soon. Just gas up the rig. As soon as I we gotta wrap go on a this Monday, pod. Tuesday, because you know I do stands and upsies on the week's ends. Mm-hmm. Well, getting back to that, so you got to pay the a bills. road trip or the or, or, or oh, yes. So as a poli sci major, and I really actually when I got into that, like I didn't, I'd never met an actor. I couldn't tell my parents. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be a theater major. I probably wouldn't have done that because I didn't see how that matriculated to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really did love people and I wanted to help people. So I was a poli sci major. And by the time I got to my third year of classes, I realized there's no chance I'm going to, you know, become a a senator because I realized at that point to be, you know, successful in politics, you have to be A, from a political family, B, from a wealthy family, or C, the smartest person in any room you walk into. I'm none of those. So I thought my pathway, if I stayed with this, was either be a lawyer or teach. In fact, that's what a counselor had told me. And I was like, I'm not not doing this anymore. So I just punted. I stopped 
going to my classes. And then my dad said, well, Dave, I don't know what you want. It's good Cecil Kector. I don't know what you want to do, but I don't think you want to go to school. And that was it. I thought he was going to chew my ass, but now I'm one of six. And if he's going to get one guy off the payroll, how happy is he? So he sold me the car I was driving for $400, a Plymouth Grand Fury 2. I bought that for $400. I got three jobs jobs at three different restaurants, and then I just worked. And then I worked and worked and worked, and I thought, how am I I know what I want to do. I want to go. I by this time now, I'd read all the books about Saturday Night Live and Jim Belushi. You read Wired, probably. Yeah, oh, right. Well, I of never course. read a book, but I'm familiar <laughs> He's with heard it. Of that's, it. That's interesting. But um, uh, you, you seem smart, so I thought you'd been well read. No, no okay, whatever. You just that. lucked into it. Yeah. You lucked into your brain, mm-hmm, did you? Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, the, by then I read tons of books about Saturday Night Live. It was my favorite show, and I wanted to be on it. And I realized a bunch of them had gone to Second City. So then me and Mike, Mike Schollmeyer, another. Uh, uh, Scottish name, uh, German, I'm joking, folks, um, drove up to Chicago and saw the second city. And on my way out, I saw they taught classes. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, no, I had I had a matchbook souvenir, right? And I had a golf pen cause, pencil because you were supposed to write down on the mailing list. I surreptitiously wrote the number for the, the school down. Why? Because I'm from Tipton. I expected someone to tap me on the shoulder going, why are you writing that down? Right. <laughs> So I got the number for classes, and then I called, and then the, that summer came and did a two-week concentrated course. I was like, heck yes, I'm going to do this. And then I moved back there, whatever it was, nine, nine months later or something like that. Chicago. Chicago. Who was in the troupe uh, back then? Well, see, that's what the luck was, that the fact that I had this delay. I was 24 when I started, and the fact that I had this delay made me luck into this unbelievable group of persons that will never happen again. So I see, I wrote all these down at one point. Let's, where should we start? So I started with Chris Farley and I were in the same second city class. Um, so Steve Carell, Steve Colbert, Amy Poehler, uh, uh, Tina Fey, Adam McKay, um, uh, Rachel Dratch, Rachel Sands. Uh, let's see. Richard Kind was just leaving. There's, hmm. there's uh, Timmy Meadows, Joel Murray, um, uh, That's quite a roster. Oh, it, yeah. not, yeah. There's there's 40. I wrote them down once. There's 40 people that were just incredibly there at the same time because we all were, grow, were the same age, all watching SNL in our young teens and all going, oh, they came from Chicago, and we all went there to get good. We didn't go there to get famous, mm-hmm. right? The goal was get good because I'm really good with grammar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did you actually – Work with or study under Dell Close. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I was I was with Dell at his peak, which was great. He had just started. He was really developing all of his ideas, and so you know, it was it was a real uh, hot house, if you will. It was a pretty amazing. Wow. And you don't know that's what you're getting. You just know that this seems. Oh, there we go. We got a picture. <laughs> Who? John Glazer. You know John Glazer. There's Adam McKay. Teresa Mulligan writes on TV. Uh, Nancy uh, Carell right next to me. That's Steve's wife. There's Timmy Meadows. Yeah. Wow. God. That's just one photo. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I don't know, the theme of life. I'm sorry, I was looking at a picture for the, the yes. pe- people. Who, uh, it's oh. just uh, show up, go to work, and uh, do the work. And, and don't have a lot of preconceived thoughts about Fame. where you're going. Right. No, just, just be, the, the goal up and is the to be the best at what this is. Right now. And the, then it'll take care of it. Yeah. The rest will yes. take care of itself, yeah. yeah. We also do have to, I guess, here's the thing. When I started, I already knew, I'm like, I'm going to be successful at this. And it wasn't like, oh, uh, uh, you, know, you a knew you were going to act, you yep. get work as an actor. Yeah, you knew that comic actor. Yeah, B- who had told you that, or had anyone told well, you? Well, I've that? been a class clown since the beginning. I'll tell you what, the beginning was second grade. It's winter time in Mrs. Powers' class. We're in the downstairs of, stairs of the convent at St. Andrew's School there, and uh, it was a Friday afternoon, and there was. Uh, uh, five minutes to kill before the bell, and we already had our coats on, and she wasn't going to teach. We had to wait for the bell, and she said, does anyone want to come up and do something? So I said yes, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I got Bob Beshin because he was the easiest laugh in class. I got him up, and I sat him down on a chair, and I'm still thinking in my head, what am I going to do? Then I took my knit cap off, and I shoved it down his coat, and then I did this pantomime like, I'm looking for my hat. <laughs> And so Bob's laughing so hard that the whole rest of the class is laughing. What was the out, you say? The bell. The bell. That's right. Like when they shut the lights off. And I got laughs, and that was it, man. Did your family understand that? 
No, not I mean, you know, I'm the third of six. It just looks like you're, you know, screaming for attention, which I was. Mm -hmm. But uh, your dad, most metal fabricators don't see comedic brilliance in young people. <laughs> most. Not they want hard workers. I'm paint with a broad brush. They want hard workers. I know a few metal fabricators. <laughs> they're, they're more serious. They're serious. They have to be, otherwise people die. That's right. Yes. Turkeys die. If they don't, they're not. Hank uh, Strassman will lose an eye if he doesn't get serious about it's it. It's Virgil Cleather. I appreciate <laughs> right. the effort. Um, you did kind of go half German. Uh, <laughs> numbers of fingers that have been lost at Kenner, Kenner Manufacturing, I'm going to say probably under five, maybe up mm, to five. Yeah, Not bad. Over the years, yeah. Mm. So... So your dad, and where was your mom with all this? She like, was taking care of the kids. And she was doing all the books, all oh, the payroll. Man. She was doing all of that. Is anybody, uh, but where did the sense of humor come from then? Well, my mom, people go like, my mom was funny when she was were. younger they or whatever. Bo they both were. Uh, my mom would kind of do little voices of the other kids sometimes. And then uh, she's from, she's one of 11 kids. Now you like this one. 11 kids, four in the religious Four? Four? Two priests, two nuns out of the 11. Wow. wow. Right? Wow. Do you think I was Catholic? Yeah. And you betcha. Mm. Dude, it was a Catholic house, but they had good humor, good Irish humor on my mom's side. They were all educated. I remember my uncle, who was uh, one of the priests, uh, uh, an actual abbot at the monastery, he got up there. Would, would you know, we, these family reunions, he'd pull out the guitar and sing these long Irish tales that were kind of funny, right? And so. It's a, I, I don't know, is it a time that is just now permanently lost in, in America? Everything like comes back childhood? around. Everything comes back around. You know, you think we're going to, you know, people still love watchers. There's going to be a watchmaker. There's going to be kids that get into that people love you know shoes that that actually fit and are, are unique there's going to be everyone needs a turkey coop but no that sir we don't sell to the consumer sir yeah we but sell, if you want sir, to broaden your horizons okay. all okay. right sir i don't know how i'm going to bring you some brochure i'm going to i'm going to ship you some brochures wrangling turkey seems like we we did not deal with the birds sir Running those across okay. the Rio Grande. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my brother put together a whole. Uh, oh, there it was, class clown from my my height. There it is. Look at wow. that. Wow, class clown. Is that you with the big head of look hair? That head, look at that gorgeous head. Good thing I lost that hair, or else Tom Cruise wouldn't work. Yeah, am yeah. I right? Now he'd be no, shit out of luck. Well, um, he'd be a stunt man. But me and Jackie be, Fairfax, senior year class clowns. So someone else's idea, of course. Why don't you get in the garbage can and Dave act like he's put you in there? <laughs> like someone else's idea, like this is what represents a class. Folks, what we're looking at is a photo from my high school senior yearbook, and it's Jackie Fairfax is in the garbage, and it's all clean. And I've, there's a garbage sack, and I'm holding it and standing behind her. Like that represents comedy. That's hilarious. See? That's or like you're some mafiosa guy who just put a hit out on somebody, right. and this will catch all the blood, should be, blood spatter. There'll be uh, here's a here's a project for us to hook up on. All right, you're not busy enough. Oh, I always carve out a little time for <laughs> nineteen Kechner podcasts. Project. Go on. Uh, one of my dear friends who graduated a year before me. He was a senior when I was a junior. Alex, he's a. a I would say he's a successful lawyer. Okay. He's not Mark Garagos, but he has a nice career for himself. Uh, he was class clown. And he's always in, in not a high, you know, not a pie in the face kind of guy. He's a, you know, he's a lawyer. He's got a good intellect. Yeah. And he's a funny guy. Brevity of the soul. But, right. you know, when I hang out with him and uh, I, of course, was class clown the following year. And when <laughs> we hang out and we have a couple of beers, he'll mutter to me that, it worked out for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I ended up pushing a pencil in some mm -hmm. cubicle somewhere. Ah. Well, it's like Heisman winners. You know, they got together one year after the other, and one guy went on to 10 years in the NFL. And yeah, so, guys, so know, coaching somewhere. I, uh, I think it'd be fun to get the class clowns that it worked out for, wow. and then the class clowns <laughs> that are working the night shift at the Hilton yeah. in Virginia. You know what I mean? That's, and a, go, that's a brilliant idea. Rich show, clown, poor show clown. the old picture yeah. from the thing. You know, now what happened Clowning around. that took the trajectory that took you, you, you eye off prize at mm. some point? You mm. had you're sailing <laughs> somewhere around 17 and a half, and then then what is it drugs? Is it an issue? Is, is it father's business? That's you know what I mean? That you got dragged into like what what got Keckner was laser focused. 
I think I was. I decided when I was 13, I did. I was like, I'm going to go do that. You right. Know, like that. You don't tell people, but it's a real dream. You were also the homecoming king? No, annual king. Different. I think that's better. How okay, never... it was better because you, you had to get you were interviewed. You had to do an interview, and you had to have some some knowledge of. Uh, you had to have a bit of a political prowess. You had to know who the president, vice president was. Oh boy! And uh, you had to know, like you know, I think uh, whoever was you know some major senators and stuff like that. And then there was a, there was a battery of questions. It was an interview. It wasn't a popularity contest. You were nominated. You and three guys were nominated, but then you'd go to a panel of adults that would uh, then de- determine who the king was. This is very like pageant esque. Well wow. yeah, I guess I guess and then was the there a ceremony? Questions. Did you get a, a scepter? There is a dance. Is it the annual dance? It's one later that year. That one was always it's less exciting. Mm-hmm. That one was like in the springtime, I think. Mm. Last chance for a crown, that's what I call it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like this is better than Homecoming King. Well, we didn't have a Homecoming King. We just had the uh, prince, uh, princess, uh, prince, and princess and queen. You know what I would do? I would just, for sake of discussion, I would just claim the mantle of Homecoming King yeah. if I were you. Okay. Well, let's play with annual king. Is. I did mm-hmm. escort the queen that year. Mm-hmm. See, there you go. Yeah. Very, yeah. That's I, all anybody I, I guess I was know. on my way. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's a, you were quite the achiever in high school. Not, I mean, come on. Annual king, mm-hmm. class clown. Come on, folks. First off, a lot of, lot of range. Uh. A lot of range there, number one. Number two, you then rolled into college, right? I <laughs> yeah. Mean, you, you yeah, I went to college. I went to, Benedict, I went to Benedictine College in Natchez in Kansas for two years by parental decree because that was a Catholic college, and my, my uncle was abbot of the monastery linked to the college. So A lot of titles in your group. Yeah. yeah. You're a legacy. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. And you pull off that Osmond haircut like a motherfucker. Really? Nice. Thank you. That yeah. was something really majestic. Could have been a different life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. You really had it going on. Right. Yeah, now be prepared when we... Do the uh, class clown, you know, when we want to know what happened. Yeah. yeah. There are going to be people that are more successful than us. Uh, Yeah, sure. Not in I the mean, comedy realm. Right. Oh, you mean just money-wise? Like, like Fortune they, 500? Yeah, but okay. people may have started some philanthropic company. You know what I mean? It could take a turn. <laughs> That's you not know, It's us. not going to be all us rubbing shit in their face. You know you what know, I mean? I think, Adam, our uh, philanthropy is giving our gift. <laughs> the joy of laughter. <laughs> That's right. It's a curse. <laughs> All right, let me hit a spot and then we'll do some uh, news. Tommy John, fall chaos in the pants, overheating one second, freezing the next. You need Tommy John. Oh, when you're that much cooler, you do everything that much better. Breathable, lightweight fabric with four times the stretch of competing brands. No wedgie guaranteed, non rolling waistbands, legs that never ride up, horizontal quick, quick draw fly as well. Hammock pouch supports and stops the awkward swing and the slap, giving everyone something to be grateful for. Tommy John, they don't have customers. They have fanatics. Over 17 million pairs sold. I will not wear anything other than Tommy John. I've tried. I tried a bargain brand. It, it, I, it did not work. And I know that sounds insane. But once you go with Tommy John, you'll never go back to what you're wearing. It's the best pair you'll ever wear. It's free. Guarantee. Right, Dawson? Go to TommyJohn.com slash Adam right now for 20% off your first order. 20% off at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. TommyJohn.com slash Adam. Seaside for details. Well, breaking Bernard news. Oh, boy. What Chris just says we have one more Bernard, but I don't know what that means. Oh, we have him introducing himself. Oh, so from the source. Bernard. Let's yeah. see how he says it. All right, so we play, we'll play the first, the first two. If you Billy like. Jack. I, lo- I saw that when I walked in. Yes. Tom Laughlin. Yeah, folk hero. Also, you know this already. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, number one independent film of all time for many, yeah. many years. Yeah, he, he yeah. wrote, directed, starred yes. in, Unbelievable. low budget, made kajillions of dollars, mm-hmm. captured the zeitgeist wow. of America, Truly. and uh, the bad guy, the sheriff's son, was named Bernard. Except for they called or him was it? Bernard. Yep. And he uh, raped Billy. Uh, raped girlf- Billy? No, his girlfriend. Billy's girlfriend by That's the so river. <laughs> yes. And uh, Billy made him drive his uh, big black Corvette right into the right into the lake. Mm. It was that, or he was going to kick his ass. Yeah. And then he was a kung fu master. Sure. I'm going to put my head, my foot, against the side of your head, Bernard. 
and there's not you're a gonna get damn, in that car yes. there's not a damn thing you're gonna Beautiful. do about it yeah he, he was gonna take his right foot and put it against bernard's left cheek and there wasn't a damn thing he was gonna do about it did you watch all three of these in in the drive-in <laughs> no, because there's two not Billy, on the Billy same Jack night. movies, but the first one was him taking on a motorcycle gang. What was the name of that one? Born Losers. Nice, well done. Nice. Yeah, then it that was where Billy Jack was great. Then Billy Jack was Billy Jack, and then there was the trial of Billy Jack, and then Billy Jack goes to Washington. It got a little oh, blowhardy. I, I didn't see the third one. Oh come on! Do you know? Do you know that that Howard Hessman does improv in the second movie? What? Oh, Howard Hessman was in the first movie. The first one, I was, I was mistaken. Yeah, he was yes. in Billy Jack. They're, they're he watching. does improv. Yes. Be, be, That's okay. part of the committee out of San Francisco. Howard which Hessman. Which was linked to Second City in Chicago. Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. They, there's <laughs> a school of American Indians up on the hill. They want to live in peace. Sure. But the redheaded sheriff won't let them. Right. And Howard Hessman plays uh, the hippie teacher who is doing an improv game with them. Oh, I'd All like right. to see that. So You did, can. All right, so so this is Bernard, or Bernard, introducing himself. I, they both call him Bernard, but his name is Bernard. Wow. And you wrote the that, script. That's a continuity error. And you <laughs> called him. I was eight when I saw it, so I was like, well, yeah. is it fucking Bernard or is it fucking Bernard? That's and I need you. to know. I need to know. None of the stoner adults could answer. Oh, wow. My entire life was just people looking at me going, what what, what the fuck are you talking Why about? Why are you asking like, the hidden question? Because he calls himself Bernard, right. but then they call him Bernard. Bernard. And they're like, just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cares. You I care? would buy a I ticket. I care. I bet Bernard yeah. would care. <laughs> I'd buy a ticket with real U.S. dollars to see you guys watch Billy Jack in live time. Oh, man. We should do, do, I would do it. version I would of do that. It. Oh, yes. I really, I really would buy a ticket to He's this. already doing it with Ray Wilson. This is very awkward. Is I don't know who that is. Mine. I would always skip dinner with Rain Wilson to go do with you. People you stop me. People <laughs> stop me on my shows and go, "Oh my god, that was my favorite episode." Where we called yeah. Rain. It was yeah. a or Rain that was called good. you. No, Rain Sorry. was here. Yeah. Then you called. That's anyway, right. Yes, that's from the archives. Yeah. Um, well, we'll take a break, but. You can find Howard Hessman doing improv with the... Uh, I told you, Chris. I told you you would find somebody calling him Bernard. Yeah. uh, You shook your head. I said it it wouldn't be easy. I didn't say it was impossible. Oh, that's French for fuck off. (laughs) Now just scrub until you see a bunch of Native Americans playing Zip Zap Zoo. You'll find the improv scene. That was a mistake to show you that. (laughs) Yes. I told you. He called himself Bernard. But Billy and his... Girlfriend, maybe they didn't want to show him the respect. Why? Uh, Because Tom Laughlin and Dolores Taylor, who plays Gene, they both say Bernard throughout the entire DVD commentary as well. So they're just saying Bernard the entire time. So it was written as Bernard maybe wasn't there that day when the actor introduced himself. I don't know where Tom's from, so apparently he must have known a Bernard. Yeah. Or that's how they spelled the same, right? right? No. But anyway. Tom's born in Wisconsin. They should have cleared it up. That's all. It bumped me when I was eight, and obviously I haven't gotten over it. Haunts you to this day. Now, now I'm haunted. I was bumped, bumped, turned into haunted. Bumped and haunted. That's my life. All right. Well, uh, found Hi- Howard Hessman playing. Uh, doing some improv. Doing some improv. <laughs> yeah, sore, sore form. His character's name is Howard. So oh. I love it. All right. Well, uh, Howard Hessman was, I don't know, in everything, but WKRP <laughs> in Cincinnati probably Best known of not, a certain age. Not yep. if you're our generation. Right, in yeah. our class. All right, quick break. Back with the news right after this. Well, I, I'm just stalling until we find that improv scene. So you tell me when to when to stop. But it's official. We know who's going to headline the Super Bowl halftime show. Her name is Rihanna. Over the weekend, chatter started getting louder that she'd be taking her talents to the big game. And by Sunday, the news was officially confirmed when Rihanna posted a picture of her hand holding an NFL football up to the sky. Um, But that's not really the headline. This is really for Brian. This also means we've kicked off early yes. in the Super Bowl season um, the the snarky sports ball tweets. They are oh. very early now. Um, the first one I saw, and I had to send to Brian immediately, is uh, somebody saying, hey, how much are the tickets to the Rihanna football concert? Ah. And the other one, it sucks that Riri's performance will be interrupted by men pushing each other for a ball. Yeah. 
I do. I my favorite. The bar's been raised. Yeah. My favorite part is like they pay school teachers fifty one thousand dollars a year, but a big tall guy he just drops a ball in a hoop and he gets millions of the, yeah because anyone can teach bitch, and there's only seven LeBron Jameses and Michael Jordans and Will Chamberlains that are ever born. That's yeah. how it works. And by the way, if there are any, if there's just seven people ever born who could fucking teach, they'd make that then money they'd too. be fetching that money too. <laughs> it's a bad comparison. Yes. Uh, we have uh, Howard Hessman right. doing okay. improv and a young Dave Keckner inspired. Uh, yep. <laughs> Taking time off right. and working that brazing torch. Look, <laughs> look at him improvising a very large steering wheel. He yeah. looks very spinal tap. Yes. Yep. That's the old twist to the scene. <laughs> it was the cops smoking a joint, gang. That's good. You that, know what I appreciate about that? That was the appropriate amount of laughter for the audience. <laughs> oh, it wasn't yes. over the oh. top. They didn't sweeten it. No. It was, <laughs> yeah, I think they did. did. Yeah. No, I, it's like uh, Keckner live show. It's the appropriate <laughs> amount. It's not, it's not sweetened. It's, no, not, it's not sugar. It's not saccharine amount. sweet. No. Yep. It's not crickets. It's just the appropriate amount that for what was, Dave is doing on stage. That and was that's pleasant. I, <laughs> knowing chuckles. That, that reminded me of something I know, but in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, forgot about that. It was such good. a set. If anyone wants to see a movie that is the early 70s, that is it. Every reference, every theme, musically, it's a thematically, <laughs> through the color palette, the lenses, just everything. Every theme, everything. If, if, if you said to somebody... You know, if my son said to me, what was 1972 like? You can only show me one reference. I'll go, you fucking watch Billy Jack and you'll, you'll be an expert in 1972. Apparently Tom Laughlin ran for president three times. Really? Once as a Democrat, then as a Republican, then as a Democrat. Really? Yeah, I don't think he won. Yeah, no. I don't remember that working out. No, history shows he didn't. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a poli sci guy. So he <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to be uh, prom... Annual. Annual, Annual King. King. Thank you, sir. By not knowing who made it to president. That's right. <laughs> uh, do you notice there were no edits in that Howard Hessman oh, take wow. there? It no. was all just one, one shot, shot there. Yeah. Which is interesting. I thought probably a little too close. I'd go a little bit wider. But whatever. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. an actor. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Well, let's talk a little Adam Levine because, boy, the meme the meme world's on fire. Uh, he had a little uh, indiscretion, a little cheating scandal, and the public spectacle that followed really upset his wife, Bahati Prinsloo. But a source tells Entertainment Tonight that the couple is looking to regain oh. the focus on their marriage. Uh, Levine became... Levine... Levine. Levine. Levine became embroiled in controversy. Was Bernard Levine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> After he was hitting up some ladies on Instagram, and uh, oh, Summer yeah. Stroh came forward with allegations that she had an affair with him for a year. He did this thing where she was like, this hot chick said she had an affair with him, and then all the women were upset, mm -hmm. and then he said... Uh, no, we flirted, but I never touched her. And then all the men got upset. I, then I got uh, upset. Right, you right, should have right. fucked You're her. Come on. What you're are you trouble. doing? You're in trouble anyway. Right. You didn't get your dick wet. Son of this stupid text. Right. But then there was one. He was working the angle where we were just kind of flirting yeah. with text. Yeah. But at one point, one of his texts said, you look even better in person. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's it's not damning. good it if you're away. saying. Now, what's his occupation? His rock star, rock Maroon god. Five. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah, yeah. it, it goes with the territory. I, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, well, this so reminded me of uh, your comparison with uh, Franken versus Weinstein. This is oh, Adam Levine and uh, and Army Hammer. They're all the same. Oh my yeah. god, no, not really. So he denied that it was ever physical, but like you said, uh, there, there may have been some little hanky panky. But he admitted using poor judgment, and he was flirtatious when he shouldn't have been. And meanwhile, the internet is just this is Christmas came early for everybody. Uh, has considered this just a gift in the meme world. Um, the DM that initially went viral was him saying, holy fuck, holy fucking fuck, that body of yours is absurd. That was followed by, it's truly unreal how hot you are, like it blows my mind. And then my favorite, I may need to see that booty, fuck. <laughs> That's why he's such a great lyricist. <laughs> uh, you know um, what my response to that is? Dudes. No. Yeah. No. But also... 
you know, when you see the chick he's married to, he's into hot chicks. Yeah, not bad. I, I don't know what she's talking about, but he's clearly made a declaration right. that it's like I'm into I'm into this. And he's into it, hot chicks. Uh-huh. Oh, guys that are into cars aren't into one car. That's They're pretty much go. into a lot of cars. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what's this gal's agenda? What's her purpose of, of blowing up his spot? Yeah. I heard on TMZ that um, she claims somebody found out about it mm-hmm. and was going to put it out or blackmail she's or whatever. So she's getting in front of it, which. Uh, if true is something, it's much better than I thought people should know or right. whatever shitty excuse most everyone uses. Or he shuts it down and she's pissed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. But now others are popping up. Yeah. And he's a fan. Yeah. I, do like, I do like when the, the, the guy's married to a chick, he's banging you on the side, and then at some point you find out that he's also flirting with other chicks and you're outraged. Yeah. Now, there is a woman he lives with right. who he's married Who to, may have some thoughts about. Who may have thoughts as well. Wasn't that a movie? I want to say Cameron Diaz and who with a, the side chick and the married, the wife second get together. Second Wives Club? I, you'd know better than I would. <laughs> is it a second to, Wives I love Club? You down. might know it because you've seen it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How soon are you going to see Hocus Pocus 2? I mean, are you in it? <laughs> Are you gonna? Are you going to the premiere? What? <laughs> that is coming out. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've never seen Hocus Pocus one. I didn't know it was a big deal. Oh it is. yeah! Suddenly it is. Come on! It looks hey, it looks like there's money there. Yeah, let's yes. mine. Oh, let's let's mine over there. Somebody get the old uh, the old metal detector out. <laughs> yes. Yes, you've heard of it. There's something. Sure. Let's do it. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, big congratulations to Jimmy Kimmel. He has signed a three-year contract extension to stay on as host and uh, EP of Jimmy Kimmel Live. Uh, Show marking its 20th season in January. Crazy. What the hell? Where where did the time go? 20th season. (sighs) I mean, I once then you start comparing them to like uh, how long was Carson on? How right, long was yeah. Leno on? How long was Letterman on? How long was Jack Parr on? I mean, he's on the cusp of overtaking. Yeah, twenty years. These it's gotta be. people. It's a, it's gotta I mean, be. I don't know. Was Leno nineteen years? Twenty one years? Uh, well, the, Carson he got two bites. So mm, true. Hmm. Two Leno. bites at the apple. Leno. Yeah. Yeah. So you put them all together. I don't know. I bet there's a guy in one of your oh, booths true. that has the answer. Yeah. yeah. Well, we look for that. Bern- I was Bernard? thinking about it. Well, Bernard looked for that. Were you there? Let's you, go, you Bernard. You must have been there on the first. I was there on the first night. I was a lowly PA in the basement, but you must have been there on the first night, the Super Bowl night. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. It was I, crazy. I, yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. Well, he says that. he had the booze. After two oh, yeah. decades at ABC, I'm now looking forward to three years of what they call quiet quitting. Uh, he's going till 2023. An inter- interview with Variety. This is how you know he's a stand-up guy. And you already know. But for the rest of us, he acknowledged he's been thinking about retiring from the show. But there are other things to consider, like his how it will affect his family, his friends, and his coworkers. And he says, eventually, I'm going to have to stop doing this. I'm not doing it forever. But like oh. to consider... Everybody else, like, how is this going to affect yeah. how many people does he employ? Well, wasn't that going to be uh, Sonny's path to success? Go work right. for Uncle Jimmy? That's what he's got to oh, hold on. Oh, you're running out of time. He's doing gay porn now. Oh, okay. Oh, well, really we kind of okay. put him in we the shifted. direction. But it's quality stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's high film. end. A lot of people don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first title. <laughs> no. Uh, well, he high can. End stuff. <laughs> he, high end stuff's the name of the first movie. He can go uh, do uh, do the last year with Jimmy Kimmel, mm-hmm. uh, but he's into sports. So and it's Jimmy the sports guy. It's yeah. gonna be cousin Sal's stuff or uh, Bill Simmons' stuff or uh, Clay Travis over at Outkick or whatever sports the Daily Wire is doing. Mm-hmm. He'll have a million directions he oh, can go if he wants guy. to. Yeah, if he wants. Love then to it, see hard workers land on their feet. Yeah, then it'll be up to <laughs> him. Wait, are we worried bootstrap. about what he's going to do? What are we worried about Jimmy? Are we worried about what Jimmy's doing next? No, my son. Oh, okay. Well, that's <laughs> Jimmy, no. <laughs> we'll I, always worry about our sons. Jimmy, okay. not me. But, I mean, he'll go to any of these places and he'll, he'll either work hard or he won't, yeah. but yeah. that'll be it for me. I'll go 
uh, you know. Uh, like a dealer at the end of their shift. Yeah, you know, I'll go. Do you think this is uh, Ben Shapiro or that's um, Bill Simmons or there's Cousin Sal? And you have can at it. Go have at it. Go do sports. I'm still holding out for Natalia to work for Garagos. She would be. That would be she, awesome. She would she'll own that, she'll oh. own that practice. She could walk then <laughs> to his house. My God. But no, G- I'll tell you who Jimmy is. Jimmy is much more concerned with the 500 people who he employs on the show than he is for his own Amazing. well-being. He is so he 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 seems he he feels generally re, responsible. genuinely responsible for everybody and their income and their livelihood. That's uh, how he is. By the way, thanks for keeping us employed during the pandemic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I yeah. It. Well, Jimmy floated me for a while. So I, just, <laughs> I just kind of broke off a piece. Most of it went up my nose, but I, I broke off a piece some for PPE, you guys there. So. Yeah. Well, there is uh, an idea in Singapore that some say we should probably adopt here. I want to get your opinion. A restaurant is providing diners with a quiet place to enjoy their meal without noise of children because they're charging a $10 screaming child surcharge. And it's been implemented and it's working. It's called Angie's Oyster Bar and Grill. It says customers have been complaining about kids running around and they're on supervised. Oyster Bar? Up and grill uh, being annoying. So they started warning people that they'll just add another 10 bucks to their bill if the kids don't behave. It's working. There's, they've seen a noticeable improvement. I think that would be fucking awesome. And I yeah. have a kid. I Until think that'd be awesome. Until we start getting notes from our doctors like, this is my service uh, son. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> He's obnoxious and he's five, but I have a note that says I need to travel with him yeah. and I need to eat oysters but with when him. When you have kids, don't you pick kid appropriate yeah. I restaurants? Do. <laughs> yeah, that's on I mean, you. I, you don't. Yeah, you don't go to high end joints. Yeah. Oyster bar? I don't think <laughs> that's on the. That's not on the you list. You want the little necks or? Because really, when kid? you're going out to dinner with kids, you've got a very limited time. We how, know this. How many? What what age was the most infuriating to take five children to a restaurant? Oh, every. No. You still the, like here's it? why, because they all order something. Yeah. And they all eat less than half of it. Yeah. So then I don't order anything. It took right. me a minute. Like, oh, just You're don't snacking. order. Right? right. Well, I'm just taking home, eat later, whatever. Right, exactly. So, but that, yeah. I, I, I can't even remember. It's What's just the like, age range? Charlie's 23, Margo's 21, Sergeant and Audrey are 16, and Eve Twins. is 11. Wow. Oh. Wow. So, so Sonny and Natalia are 16, right? They're both, yeah. yeah. June. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. June, yeah. Mm-hmm. Ours you, are June 2nd, yours are June... 6th. 6th, yeah, yeah. Oh. Or 7th. I was going to say, Wait you minute. don't know. They were supposed to be June first, 6th. First, first week of June. We got rid yeah. of the triple, you, the mark of the devil. Boy, girl, twins, first week of June. And you love the name Sergeant. I love that name. I love the name Sonny. Yeah, unless he joins the military <laughs> and rises to the rank of colonel. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> it's confusing. It's <laughs> Confuse Colonel Sergeant, Colonel Sergeant, Colonel Sergeant, Sergeant, Sergeant Lieutenant Sergeant. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying it could happen, right? I don't think I don't see him going that way. No, you never know. I wouldn't be opposed because they're going to learn, you know, discipline and hard work and all that stuff. And you know, you know, the thing is, they're going to know what they want to do when they get out. Oh yeah, right. Mm-hmm. If nothing else. I'm, I'm, I have no problem with compulsory two years of some types of civic oh, service. We're going to need it. I mean, we're, kids are getting so fucking pasty and fat and shitty and lazy. Yeah. Like, we're, we're going to have to Guess what you don't something. get the first day you, you join up for the civic service? A uh, phone lunchable. for two years. Uh, a phone for two years. <laughs> oh, we'll yeah. salt them. We'll salt them with Lunchables. <laughs> yeah. You get plenty of sodium. <laughs> and well, if you've ever been to Israel, Peter, maybe. The, yeah. the 20-year-olds, 19-year-olds, pretty hot. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, it works. Walking around with those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're going to have to institute something because kids are pretty much jumping the shark. And they, they don't necessarily, so civic service, but they also have to do trades. I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm not going to militarize the thing. Yeah, but I would, you know, you had it's trade service and also, you know, uh, civic service. Like, you could go build a well, go whatever, go to a farm and help out. Something, you know, with so practical. So, and also that also helps you determine. Like, I don't want to do this. I'm definitely going to make it a choice now. And this is all just pragmatic shit that's never going to fucking fly mm-hmm. in this woman's army. Oh, and I'm sorry. Done. I thought I believed in you. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint. I'm with you. It's diet and exercise. Everyone needs to fucking get out. Everyone needs to break sweat. Everyone needs to find out what they don't want to do. Everyone needs to trade. Everyone needs some guy, some DI yelling at them or some coach or something. It's all the stuff we've done away with, we desperately need, and I don't think it's ever coming back. But I wish it would. I, I wish there was a compulsory, 
you know, a job core. You know, I'm like, you're yes. going to go clear brush in the forest mm-hmm. and you're going to learn what work is and you're going to learn how to get along with other mm-hmm. people and work under people and you're going to know what a hierarchy is. You're going to learn respect. And I, I, I would love all. And then you're going to take plumbing classes <laughs> on, on the weekends. Like, I would love all of it. Bare minimum. We're just never yep. going to do it. Well, if that kind of attitude prevails, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> We have time for one more. One more. I really want you to see this. Um, we talked about this the other day about how you can only go so fast in a car backwards. Mm-hmm. Well, somebody heard you. Yes, um, I got a, the tweet. Okay, well, a driver at a racetrack in Kentucky, his name's Scott Burner, Bernard, Bernard. Uh, <laughs> broke a Guinness World Record when he drove a 2017 Corvette Stingray for one mile backwards and it took him 75.18 seconds go ahead put the video up uh he smashed the previous record of 97 seconds and this is no small feat uh, as burner said it took about two years to make sure all of the guinness world record rules would follow uh, would be followed in his attempt I think so you're gonna to see him 50 miles an hour yeah you're gonna see him coming coming down the track uh, backwards and go ahead and put on the uh the audio if you have it i don't know if he yeah, look at it. I don't. It's weird, right? I don't know if he regeared it or the Corvette will go fifty miles an hour backwards. Mm. Seems like a weird gearing thing. I mean, is that impossible to go backwards fifty miles an hour? Obviously not. Yeah, but no, I mean, no, as it no, is, you'd have so to crack the transmission it. open and regear it. So it's I would not say. stuck. I don't. I'm disqualifying think so. this. <laughs> Plus, it's not very exciting footage. But what if I? What if I told you he had? Fast food in his lap, and his girlfriend was riding shotgun. Oh, that's good. And he had his arm cocked over the passenger seat and was eating like a French fry mm-hmm. while... That's while, good. Uh, no, smoking. And what arguing they, with her about something. Arguing with her about something <laughs> with a lit cigarette. Would you then put him back in the books? Because I would. Yes. Don't you guys remember the film License to Drive with the two Corys and how yeah. the big, the, the pivotal scene in the movie is he has to drive to the hospital backwards? Mm-hmm. It can be done. Find out, Chris. I don't know. What is the max speed of a Corvette or Mustang or something in reverse? I, I'm i guessing we get to 50, you've re-geared it. Don't you just call Matt Damon? That's me. Oh, for Bourne? No, Ford versus... Ferrari. Oh, yeah. I Sorry. I was on um, I was Did you on like Corvette. that movie? I really like it. I that. love that movie. Yeah. I'm looking, the first thing I see is, well, first of all, for him, yeah, Burner's Corvette can hit 54 miles per hour in reverse gear, but he did not have to drag race backwards for the record. He just, I guess, had to go. But Drive.com says on this YouTube channel, um, aptly named Always in Reverse, in which they test the top speed of different cars in reverse, Mr. Burner found that... Uh, sorry, he found the seven-speed manual C7 Corvette hit a top speed of... 87 kilometers per hour. Kilometers. That's 50. Bernard. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, yeah. Uh, mid-50. I guess, I guess maybe it can do its stock. It seems un... Thanks to its three... And I don't know what I'm saying here. Thanks to its 343 kilowatts. It just says KW This is all Power European output. shit. Yeah, okay. Real quick, Gina, can you tell us how big the said. audience was? What you just viewed? How big was the audience <laughs> for this guy's burner, backward burner? I saw at least a dozen people. I saw one. Yeah. One guy hiding behind a high concrete. Yes. Thinking he was the, he was one of the he was the still photographer, which was even less exciting than the video. <laughs> Going he was rolling on it. All right. Well, we'll see if we can suss this out. Maybe tomorrow we'll get back to it, but uh, we'll bring it home, Gina. You Grad. got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. I may need to see that booty. Fuck. <laughs> Gina, Gina. That was the news with Gina Grad. Keckner's doing his live shows, and he's going to be in Cincinnati at the Funny Bone this Friday and Saturday, and then there's going to be Flappers out here in Burbank on October the 5th. 5, yes. October 5, and then October 7th and 8th, Funny Bone in Columbus, Ohio. For dates, you go to davidkechner.com, and you can say hi to him on the, on the Goldbergs as well. Wednesday nights on ABC. Richie Stevens, The Gangster's Guide to Sobriety, My Life in 12 Steps is the name of that book. I'm going to be at the Hollywood Improv October 19th with my stand-up friends doing live shows out here. And you can go to amcurl.com for all my live shows and a new book, Everything Reminds Me of Something, is out as we speak. And until... 
next time. Sam Crow for David Keckner, Richie Stevens, and Bob Bryan and Gina Grad saying Mahalo. Mahalo.